I did it. I finally didn't interrupt somebody when I pressed the recorded recording in progress button. As we were when we were chatting before, as we were preparing, I, I pointed out that after four years of doing recording Zoom meetings at least once a month, I've never pressed the button at a time that didn't interrupt someone until today. Bravo, Patrick. And that's that's I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna leave the meeting now. That's 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 a high <laughs> note for me. That's I gotta leave on a high note. <laughs> well, it's good to peak on Friday. You're all set for the weekend now. Exactly. I, I, it's, I'm going to remember this moment. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Good morning. Hey, you, Tim Obrey. How are you doing? Good. Good, good. All right, everyone, I think we're going to get started right at 930. And um, as has happened in the past, people kind of come and go, which is awesome as uh, as the morning um, progresses around us. So I say bonjour tout le monde. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to our the third edition of Bright Ideas. Uh, my name is Donna Petty, and I'm the Director of Integration Research and Evaluation here at CMHA Ottawa. And uh, my pronouns, pronouns are her, she, and I'm really honoured to be your host for this wonderful event here at CMHA. And we're going to start, if I can get this to move here. There we go. Going to start with our land acknowledgement um, here. And, you know, I would like to share that I am a visitor here on this land, and I'm descended from Irish immigrants who came to this land trying to escape a cholera epidemic and then famine. And in my youth, while I learned and heard of the range of events that really drove people here and brought people to these shores, there was really never any education about those who were indigenous to this land and those were, who were here long before my family came. So as we gather virtually to discuss the research and evalu evaluation activities of our organization, I'd like to ground us by acknowledging that CMHA Ottawa is located on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. And we recognize the Anishinaabe as the traditional caretakers and defenders of the land that we now know as Ottawa. We're grateful to live and work on the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. Now, as hosts of this event, we also acknowledge the historical and ongoing colonial research practices that have harmed Indigenous peoples, including the misuse of Indigenous people's personal information that was used to support exploitation and inequality, as well as the use of Western research methods that dismiss Indigenous data governance in ways of knowing. So CMHA makes it our individual, community, and social mission to build connections between non-Indigenous and Indigenous peoples that are based on knowledge of our history and mutually respectful relationships that will provide dignity for all. We commit to learn, reflect, and take action on our decolonizing journey. And this includes in our evaluation and research practices where we strive to honor indigenous voices, expertise, knowledge, and governance. And in doing so, I'd really like to acknowledge Nicole Belanger, the artist of the beautiful um, picture of the mural, which hangs um, on the wall here in our office. All right, so we're going to get um, going for our first speaker to welcome us here is Dr. Susan Farrell, who is, I will say, our relatively new CEO of CMHA Ottawa, but it won't be for long that you'll be new, Susan, because you'll be here almost a year now. That's right. <clears throat> Good morning and thank you. Thank you, for, uh, Donna, for the introduction, for hosting today and for the powerful and important land acknowledgement. 
as I was thinking about the fact that this wonderful event, Bright Ideas, is in its third iteration on the unceded and unsurrendered territory, I thought about the Indigenous practice of storytelling and the importance of passing information in so many different mediums, most specifically speaking about it and speaking about how it affects our communities and affects life going forward. Indigenous persons shared a very rich history that way, an oral history that was critically important. And I hope that Bright Ideas will continue to be an annual tradition where we will speak to the research, its implication, its use by all, for all, uh, and continue to build on the wisdom of our ancestors. I'd also like to wish you a happy Mental Health Week. This is Mental Health Week. It's been an active week filled with discussions about mental health and particularly in our case, community mental health. And community mental health is such an important part of the entire spectrum of healthcare and mental health care and has many unique elements that will be well displayed today in the Bright Ideas Forum. Community mental health, however, also has a, a rich history of being grounded in research and evaluation. The practices that are before us come from dedication of so many learners, professors, thinkers, peers, knowledge users, and others to give us a collection of ways to understand the communities in which we live, work, and thrive, and how we use that information and pass it forward. So it's particularly exciting that Bright Ideas happens in Mental Health Week and in the celebration of all of that and continues to, to remind us of the importance of research and evaluation in mental health. As Donna mentioned, I am the fairly new uh, CEO here at CMHA. What that means is I'm new enough that today when I led in the person to collect the shredding, I still wasn't sure where all the shredding boxes were and I didn't know where the photocopy room was. But I've been here long enough to have an appreciation that CMHA depends so critically on the research and evaluation that happens in partnerships across our community. So I'm grateful that you're able to be here with us today to share your information and how we use it and to learn from others. I'm also grateful that this is recorded because I know that that is an important way for people who can't be here today to continue to watch and learn this information. My last point is that uh, research and evaluation is also critically important for shaping advocacy and policy. It should shape all policy, and we're still working on that as the direction. But in Mental Health Week, we think an awful lot about how is it we continue to advocate for the mental health of all and to shape policies that are meaningful and evidence-based. To that note, I will be on and off the screen a little bit today because on that vein, the Alliance to End Homelessness, who is looking at housing-based advocacy and working to shape some local policies is also having its board meeting. So I will be in and out, certain to watch the entire recording and very, very grateful for everyone's participation today. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. And we're grateful for your presence here at CMHA and to have such a great advocate for research and evaluation. Um, Susan did her research way back in the 90s here in CMHA when she was completing her doctorate. So she has a long history in terms of um, supporting and being invested in community mental health research. Which brings me to our next um, speaker, Tim Obrey, Dr. Tim Obrey from the University of Ottawa. Um, longtime friend and uh, supporter of CMHA, who has been a partner with us in endless research and evaluation projects over the years. Welcome, Tim. I know you're there, Tim. I heard you earlier. Here we go. Okay, <laughs> there he is. Here we go. Yeah, sorry. All right. Okay. Um, great. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, CMHA Ottawa and Susan um, for inviting me um, and the students from the University of Ottawa to be part of this uh, third annual uh, Bright Ideas events. Um, I've been asked to say a few words about the importance of integrating research in the community mental health services. Um, in preparing to do that, I, I kind of went down memory lane and thought about how much community mental health services have changed and been developed 
um, over the course of my career. Uh, at this point, I, I've become more of a historian than a practitioner, some people say. Um, but you know, when I started my graduate studies in 1981, um, evidence-based programs for the most part didn't exist uh, in community mental health services because we were just at the point of deinstitutionalizing. Um, in fact, the only program that I, that I recall that we'd started to study in the late 70s uh, and that had evidence from a, a, a clinical trial in Wisconsin that, that showed its uh, effectiveness was assertive community treatment. Um, and as a result, as a way of responding to deinstitutionalization, first in the US and Canada, ACT was scaled up to support ex-psychiatric patients living in the community. And that was really the start of the community mental health movement. Later in the 90s, early 2000s, we started to hear about new approaches at, that were research based, um, including uh, intensive case management, uh, housing first, which came on stream um, in the late 90s, some of the first research and supported employment. And, and, and there are others, but those are the big ones that really, uh, they really kind of uh, focused on developing with research and they took off um, because the creators knew enough to integrate research to examine their early implementation and effectiveness. And you know, CMHA and people who work at CMHA uh, know very well Housing First. It's, it's central um, to the mission. Um, CMHA has contributed to the research uh, in this area uh, in significant ways. Uh, and I'm convinced that if Samson Barris, who, who's the, the creator of Housing First, um, if he hadn't started housing first right from the get-go with his pilot and did research along the way, we would have never seen the scaling up uh, what has become quite frankly an international movement. It went from New York City, uh, it started to show up in the States and all along there was rigorous research done, uh, including clinical trials. Um, and that, over the past 20 years, has really made a, a difference. Now, when I look over the list uh, of what we presented today, um, we're seeing early research on pilots that I hope will take off and will also enrich community mental health services. Um, new services like recovery colleges, social prescribing, digital health promotion, getting, getting our folks, getting people who are being served by CMHA um, access um, to uh, uh, digital um, devices um, so that they can be part of, 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 of the, this growing online community. And we also have a, a pilot that's been going on for a number of years that we're gonna hear about, mental health support for frequent users of emergency departments. Um, and these will make important contributions um, to these new kinds of services. As well, at the same time, um, we're also gonna hear about adaptations to existing programs. And this is the evolution of programs uh, in the community mental health sector that includes delivering case management to seniors uh, around the issue of aging in place, integrating um, diversity, equity, inclusion into community mental health services. This is how we want to adapt uh, these services so that they can, they can be available and be effective with uh, a, a large range of populations. Finally, the list includes needs assessments, which are really the precursor to developing new programs. Um, uh, looking at um, uh, cardiovascular risk factors, uh, taking into account climate change. Uh, so you can see research is very important to keep uh, community mental health services contemporary um, and uh, targeting 
um, the issues that we're going to be facing in, in the next number of years. And then finally, I also want to say, and I really like the idea, I think it might be the first time uh, with Bright Ideas of integrating a knowledge mobilization piece into it. And, and our friends from uh, Simon Hopkins, Nathan Fung, who've done a really nice short documentary uh, on Housing First. Um, so it's a really, really rich lineup um, that, that we're seeing. And I, uh, in closing, I just want to uh, highlight that the project involved a really meaningful collaboration uh, between researchers, staff at CMHA, and people from our local universities, and of course, from the University of Ottawa. Uh, and I have to say, it wouldn't be possible to do the, this research, this work, without the receptivity and the commitment of the agency uh, to, to integrate uh, studies uh, into the innovative services that are being delivered. And I wanna really acknowledge that and I wanna thank them for the important role they play uh, in the research that we have the privilege uh, of conducting uh, with folks at CMHA. So thank you, merci. Thanks, Tim. And uh, it, it's true, your acknowledgement of the importance of having a, an organization such as CMHA, I know there's other organizations you work with, but if we didn't have the um, expertise and support from universities, um, this wouldn't get off the ground um, either. So this is what we really wanna work at, building more and more um, strong connections and strengths and um, so that this doesn't seem to be a one-off or an unusual event, that this is just how we do business um, as a university, as a community, and as agencies. So as we launch into this fabulous program here, um, you can see we have, we've kind of grouped things into various theme areas this year. And with, as Tim alluded to, a, a special knowledge translation um, um, presentation at the end. So let's just launch right into things. So our first presentation is in the our area of uh, evaluation and support that supports equity, diversion, and inclusion initiatives. So I'm going to stop sharing here. So our first presentation is from Kim Turner, who is a student at the University of Ottawa. A hey, hi, Kim. Um, PhD Hi. candidate, soon to be full on, get rid of that candidate at the end of it, <laughs> and presenting on promoting digital health equity amongst people with serious mental illness, a community-based participatory needs assessment. Awesome. Thanks so much, Donna. Um, so I'm just trying to, I do have a presentation that I want to share screen for, um, and I was going to, I'm trying to do this claim host thing, but I actually don't see the button. Do I need to claim host in order to share my screen or, oh, it seems to be working anyways. So, okay, I guess I don't need to do that. One second. So I'm just going to get this set up. Perfect. Okay, does everybody see my presentation? Oops, I can't, there we go. Sorry, I didn't see if there was like a thumbs up or anything because you guys were still hidden. Can everyone see my present? Okay, we're all good, I see your thumbs up. Thanks, Donna. All right, so uh, I'm Kim, I'm a clinical psychology student from U Ottawa, and so I'm going to be talking about my dissertation today, which is a participatory um, needs assessment, a community-based one that I'm doing a partnership with CMHA Ottawa, looking at promoting digital health equity for people uh, with serious mental illness. Um, and so I always say this when I present about this, but I actually chose this topic before the pandemic hit, but I think the pandemic has, you know, really highlighted uh, the role and even accelerated the role that digital technology plays in, you know, so many areas um, of all of our lives. Um, and I think, you know, it can have a lot of benefits, but it also poses a lot of problems for people who have less access. And so one group that does have less access to digital technology is people with serious mental illness. And so my project is really focused on, you know, making sure that they aren't being left behind in all of this. And I think 
something that's really validated the the work that I'm doing is just the amazing response that I've had from, you know, clients and, and staff and leadership at CMHA in terms of, you know, their enthusiasm and supporting this project. So if any of you are here today, thank you. Well, I know some of you are here today, so thank you so much. Um, and so, you know, just in terms of using that term digital health equity, what do I mean by that? So I'm really talking about the role of access to and use of digital technology in, in people's health and the idea that, you know, everyone should be benefiting from digital technology. Um, and so the digital determinants of health, so those are the factors uh, that impact, um, you know, the potential for digital technology to, you know, either promote, um, di uh, to promote health um, or to contribute to, to health disparities. And there's a lot of different, you know, frameworks for thinking about this. But when I was reviewing the literature, I noticed that a lot of the focus was on how is digital technology being used, you know, like within the healthcare system directly to deliver healthcare, which is of course super important, but there's also all kinds of other ways that, you know, digital technology can influence our health, be it through, you know, accessing things like education or social support or employment or, you know, being able to work for apartments and, and things like that. So I wanted to incorporate that element into my project as well. Um, and so I'm going to talk about two different uh, studies uh, that we did. Uh, and so the first part, we really wanted to kind of we'll map out what is the CMHA client experience with digital technology? What does that look like? How are they currently using it? Um, does that, you know, differ from how they want to be using technology? What are the different, you know, kind of barriers and needs uh, that they're experiencing? Um, and also how does um, digital technology use uh, relate to, to their health? And so to look at this, we conducted uh, focus groups with CMHA clients um, and also staff. So we did four focus groups, three with clients, one with staff. Um, and we had uh, a focus group guide kind of looking at these different questions. Uh, we recorded the focus group and we're doing a mixed inductive, deductive, uh, qualitative analysis. Whoops. I'm going through this a little bit <laughs> quickly because I have so much to talk about today. Uh, in just 10 minutes, but we're still in the process of doing the broader analysis, but we did complete uh, a partial analysis looking specifically at those like needs and barriers and also uh, solutions and actions that were discussed so that we could uh, use that to inform the next stage of the project. And so this just gives you uh, a quick idea of the kinds of things that came up in different areas. So like at that individual level, cost and lack of skills were huge, um, you know, needs that came up. Uh, and then there was also, you know, suggestions for how do we improve this, things like expanding lending programs, uh, peer support, digital skills training um, at the community level. Uh, some things were really like, you know, lack of some community support and access, uh, lack of knowledge in the community more broadly. So people to go to tools and services that's talking more about directly like the different apps or like healthcare service that someone's um, accessing. And so user friendliness, accessibility were issues that came up. Um, and then we also talked about, well, okay, the healthcare system more broadly. And so for this, there was, you know, the inconsistency of digital platforms, you know, through different services, um, really complex uh, referral systems to be able to access services that could only be done online, things like that. Um, and then we also talked about, okay, well, what's happening at the policy level? And so really a lack of policy on, on regulating costs. And people did, again, have some ideas about, you know, how can we improve this that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and so then the second stage of the project was like, okay, we have this kind of broad idea of what's going on for people, but we really want to know, um, well, what are the priorities of CMHA clients themselves, um, of staff members. Um, and so uh, to do this, we wanted to look at, all right, we identified some needs and, and barriers in step one. Is there anything else that maybe we missed? Um, what are the different actions that could be taken? Um, and we looked at, you know, what can CMHA do, but also, you know, other actors, you know, government, uh, researchers, other agencies, et cetera. Um, and then we wanted to, most important part of this was like, okay, well, what's the highest priority in terms of those needs and barriers and then the actions and solutions? What is the highest priority for people? And so to do this, we also did groups, but we used a nominal group technique. So it's a little bit different in that basically what happens is there's 
uh, stage where you know we present the the question and people have time to think about it independently and generate ideas and then you go around the group and around robin so each person one by one presents their idea about like okay well what is this need or barrier then we talk about it as a group and then everybody votes on you know what is it that they think is most important um, and then we talk about the results of that vote <laughs> and then uh, people vote again um, and so for this, we uh, did record these, and so we're doing a qualitative analysis of uh, the discussion components, but also a descriptive analysis of the uh, data for the voting. Uh, so again, the analysis is still uh, underway, but I will present like a little bit of information about so the participants, we did have, you know, quite diverse participants, the age range was from 22 to 61. We looked at a uh, level of uh, comfort with technology on a scale from one to 10. And so that did range, you know, we had some people who rated it a one, some people who rated it a 10. So range of comfort, 7.5 is the average, uh, 12 male, seven female, one non-binary uh, participant. And this is in terms of uh, the client participants. We also had a staff group. And then in terms of results, so these are the preliminary results in terms of the priorities. Um, and we looked at this separately for, for client and for staff uh, in terms of um, needs and, and barriers affecting clients. And so you can see the first two are, are identical. So it's really like cost and also um, lacking those, those digital skills. Uh, but then it kind of differs. And so clients really did talk a lot about like safety concerns online, privacy concerns, um, and then just this idea of flexibility and sometimes lacking either virtual or in-person options. Um, in terms of staff, um, they talked about, you know, barriers for clients related to like lost, stolen and, and sold devices, uh, the difficulty of, of multiple platforms and also them being uh, impacted by certain program eligibility uh, issues. Um, in terms of the recommendations and conclusions, again, still in progress. So this is just a uh, preliminary, but these were some of the top recommendations uh, in the priority setting stage that came up for CMHA and for others. So for CMHA, talking about, you know, how can IT support be improved, um, peer support, having drop-in center courses. People also talked about, you know, like having IT support that actually goes out to clients in the community, um, you know, then also allocating or finding uh, funds to support hardware, potentially reintroducing or revamping the, the phone handout program, expansion of lending programs, things like that. Uh, having hybrid care models, um, providing uh, private spaces, so not necessarily use of computers, but just even private spaces for people to do appointments, things like that. Um, and potentially supporting clients to pay uh, arrears uh, with Rogers for the Connected to Success program. Um, in terms of others, there was a lot of talk about, you know, well, the government's role and 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 potentially regulating cost. Um, Rogers expanding Connected for Success to to other people, having internet and in public spaces, um, sharing information about things like community um, access, and also, you know, increasing funding related to technology through programs like uh, OW and ODSP. In terms of knowledge mobilization, so now we have this kind of general list, um, but it's like, okay, how does this actually get implemented? And so we're going to be uh, looking at doing interviews with key informants at CMHA Ottawa to really create uh, a plan for uh, those recommendations and thinking about them, you know, in the context of, okay, what's been done currently, what's been done in the past, um, and uh, looking at like feasibility, potential impact, things like that in order to come up with a plan uh, coming forward. But I do see that I am seven seconds over time here. So I will wrap it up. I'm sorry, I know it was a lot of information in a short period of time, but um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, and again, thank you to, to anyone who's participated and, and supported the project. It, it really means a lot, thank you. Awesome, Kimberly, thank you so much. Um, and I forgot to mention, if folks have questions, please just put them in the chat. And um, when we have time, folks could maybe um, answer live. But if not, um, we always share them with the researchers who respond and then they go into the final report or they can follow up directly. They're usually very interested in people that are interested in their research. So that's awesome. Thank you, Kim. So our next uh, presenter is uh, Conrad Chikowski, who is also a PhD candidate at the University of Ottawa. And this is um, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committees at CMHA Ottawa, 
where he undertook an evaluation of purpose, processes, and potential. Welcome, Conrad. Hello, everyone. Let me just get set up over here. Okay. So uh, thanks for the introduction. My name is Konrad Trachowski. I'm a pronouns he, and um, yes, I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of Ottawa. I should be done with my PhD at the end of this summer. So that's that's fairly exciting. And this project was supervised by uh, Christi Dr. Christina Mushler. Um, and je vais faire cette présentation d'une façon bilingue. Uh, je vais présenter des sections clés en français, but if you don't speak French and I'm speaking French, then I will leave the actual slides themselves uh, in English so you can follow along. So if I'm speaking French and you don't speak French, you could just pay special attention to the slides. So for this actual presentation, what I intend to do is just talk about DEI initiatives in general and why we uh, tend to have those in organizations with their, what their purposes generally are. I'll speak a little bit about the specific committees at CMHA Ottawa that I was hired to uh, evaluate primarily their purpose, their activities, their priorities to really kind of get them uh, all their committees aligned with one another. I'll speak a little bit about my evaluation methods. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the interviews, the focus groups that I conducted to really make sure that everyone within these committees is on board and on the same page as it relates to their general objectives when it comes to these committees. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the results. So what do we actually identify as priorities and then the implications? So why this actually matters, um, what these kinds of committees, what these specific committees at CMHA Ottawa uh, aim to do and, and ultimately how their, um, how their work, how the, the, the benefits of their work, uh, is ultimately meant to trickle down to benefit the clients, um, which is, which is really kind of the most, the most important part there. So les initiatives en matière de diversité, inclusion, um, diversité, équité et inclusion, uh, ils ont vraiment l'objectif de créer un environnement qui est respectueux à la diversité culturelle pour les employés et les clients. Donc c'est pour les employés, mais aussi pour les clients. Um, elle vise à promouvoir l'équité en matière de santé, de mettre à disposition des ressources pédagogiques sur le uh, de, uh, e. uh, so really what we're doing here is we're really trying to focus on the benefit to um, to to staff uh, who are ultimately supporting supporting clients and also ensuring that the um, you know when it comes to DI initiatives it's also really important to make sure that the the, the composition of the staff is reflective of the composition of the committee uh, of the community that that they tend to serve. Donc le but, le but de cet objectif c'est vraiment de Définir de façon claire les objectifs, les objectifs et aussi les différentes tâches de les différents comités uh, à CMHA Ottawa. Donc, l'organisation veut, veut vraiment s'assurer qu'il y a vraiment une, une cohérence entre les trois comités, tant au niveau de leurs objectifs et les méthodes pour obtenir les objectifs. So, there's the Anti-Black ta anti Racism Task Force, Gender and Sexual Diversity Committee, and the Indigenous Committee. And it's really those three committees that um, have a number of fairly common objectives, but at this point, they really, CMHA Ottawa really wanted to standardize their practices so that they're really kind of following a fairly similar model. Obviously, their, their activities and their objectives might be slightly similar, given that they're looking at different areas, but generally speaking, they wanted to kind of figure out, okay, what exactly are our priorities and how are we gonna go ahead and carry those out? And so my job was really to kind of go in there and have lots of conversations with committees, with committee chairs, uh, the larger committees, some, some additional staff as well, who maybe are not part of committees just yet, or maybe were previously, to really see what is most important for everybody and how are we going to go ahead and achieve that. And so I can hopefully create a bit of a roadmap for them for, you know, um, what, what, what your committee meetings might be ultimately uh, aiming to achieve in the future. So how did we do that? We followed a bit of a logic model, um, logic model method as a guide. So generally speaking, a logic model is a way to just illustrate how a project, uh, how, how a program works. So 
you know, here at the bottom left corner, you can actually see um, a document that we would frequently use that looks at the, the resources that the, the, the program needs. In this instance, the program is really the, the kind of committees or the standardized way we want these committees to work. So what resources do they need? What activities? What are the, what are the things that they're actually, these committees are actually gonna do? The outputs, what are they actually gonna produce? Um, and then the outcomes. So what, what do these committees actually want to achieve? In shorter, uh, shorter in terms of shorter term and in terms of longer term. So we'd often start at these the level of outcomes, figure out what they actually want to achieve, figure out what's feasible, what's a priority for everybody, and then we would kind of work backwards to see, okay, if we want to achieve this, then what do we need to actually do to to get to that as we develop this this kind of roadmap. So we identified three general priorities. The first was just just and and just figuring out the general committee functioning. So for these committees, it was very important to have regular and purposeful committee meetings. We often talked about this idea of meetings being proactive and not necessarily reactive. So ensuring that they have they have a a, a good plan and purpose. Um, and and some of that also included ensuring that recruitment processes are geared toward ensuring that the folks who are recruited uh, to work at CMHA Ottawa reflect the broader community that they mean, that they hope to serve. Staff training and support also came out as a priority. So really evaluating and thinking about, you know, what, what training programs are most relevant to help staff support clients. Um, it was also important to, to think about developing a, a publicly accessible repository of resources so that if someone at CMHA Auto as staff members having uh, some difficulty supporting a client as it relates to a specific kind of DEI related issue. Um, and maybe they do contact the committee and say, hey, I need a little bit of help with this. If they already have this repository of resources that they've just compiled over time, they could say, here's a really nice article or here are some really nice guidelines. Here are some best practice guidelines to deal with this. And data use also came out as a uh, one of the kind of major identified priorities. So really making sure that the decisions that they make are, or, or the decisions that they make are basically evidence-based. So making sure that they can regularly monitor um, how the organization is doing in terms of DEI, in terms of the composition of staff, in terms of the clients that they serve, in terms of the training uh, that people are completing and how often, how many people are completing the training, for example. And that would really mean smaller, you know, maybe via data dashboards, just a, basically a display of data where on a fairly regular basis, they can just have a look to see uh, how CMHA Ottawa doing in, in terms of the numbers. And then all, sometimes also having these larger audits where someone like an evaluator such as myself might come in and just kind of do a larger evaluation to, to, to think about, okay, um, are we still on track to meet these priorities? Uh, or do we need to make any adjustments? And as a final step, uh, I'm currently developing an anonymous survey to be delivered to all CMHA Ottawa staff. We're still figuring out the exact areas of focus, but some of the things that, you know, as, as, as I finish up my project here, something I would like to leave the organization with is, um, is really just to give them an idea of, you know, we, we talked a lot about what, um, what, what committee members themselves um, you know, what their priorities are and what's really important to them in terms of DEI initiatives. But this is just going to be a much wider to look at all staff to really see how, how comfortable are people with asking clients about their identity, for example. Are there specific DEI issues that people uh, maybe tend to have more trouble um, uh, dealing with or less comfort dealing with, which would probably mean that we could eventually uh, try and prioritize training for something like that. Um, and, and also asking about diversity related characteristics of the staff surveyed uh, to get a, a really good idea of do they actually reflect the, the community they're serving and maybe in, in future recruitment, are there certain areas that we should target more? And again, this will be a not, an anonymous survey that only I will have access to. I'll only have access to, uh, to the data and I will give CMHA Ottawa aggregate data. So what that means is just the, the, the general percentages of how people tended to, to respond rather than individual responses. So as I conclude here, I'll I talk a little bit about po project implications. So first of all, what does my project really aim to achieve here? 
Um, the, the, the main goal here is really to just develop these next step recommendations. So I have collaboratively decided on with the uh, with these three committees uh, on what their priorities are, what, what areas would they like to affect most and what's most important to them. Um, and so a lot of that does come down to, to committee functioning. So I'm trying to develop here a very clear roadmap. So this, these, are, these, these are the objectives you want to achieve. We looked at that, you know, that, that logic model of, you know, these are the outcomes, these are the activities you're going to need to do to achieve those outcomes. These are the inputs and resources you're going to need. So now my job is really just to develop a bit of a roadmap for each one of those things, which will give, give the committees, um, uh, basically a bit of a plan for the next number of months, maybe years, um, when it comes to their own strategic planning about what they want to do to affect change um, as uh, change priorities as they have kind of defined them throughout my evaluation. Staff training as well uh, came up a lot. And uh, for me, that organization-wide survey is really, really important as it relates to staff training to really get an idea of, you know, what does staff really believe that they need training in? Is there low hanging fruit? Are there some things that everyone says, yes, I have a lot of trouble with this and I really love training about that. Perfect. Maybe that's the kind of training that I will suggest that they do first um, to get to get some easy wins and, and ultimately to help uh, staff with issues that they genuinely find um, they, they, they need help with to make it as useful as possible and to get as much buy-in as possible within the organization. So data use is a really big one too. So, you know, if we're ensuring that CMHA Ottawa is collecting and monitoring and using the data that's available to them um, uh, as much as possible as it relates to tracking progress with DEI issues, um, tracking the, the extent to which people are actually engaged with, with staff training, for example, um, that will that will ultimately help with evidence-based decision-making. So making decisions about these different DEI issues, about uh, training object, uh, training needs, uh, about different data they might need to collect in the future, making sure that that's all um, based on evidence. And client care, you know, most importantly, at the end of the day, all of these practices are supposed to work together and kind of cumul cumulatively trickle down to the benefit of clients. So if staff feel more comfortable to ask clients the questions that they should be asking, if they know what questions they should be asking in certain situations that, as they relate to uh, to DEI issues, um, then then clients will hopefully feel much more um, much more comfortable in, in in disclosing that if they have any issues related to 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 DEI uh, and will ultimately feel much more uh, much more supported. And that's everything. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, my email is over here just first and last name at uottawa.ca if you have any uh, additional comments or, or anything else. Thanks. Thanks so much, Conrad, for that really essential and important work that you're uh, helping us um, figure out how to do things better. Um, so our next presentation is from Alyssa Hazabond, who is a PhD student from the University of Ottawa. And this is really looking at evaluating um, our 55 plus intensive case management program for clients. Hi everyone, I'm just gonna share my screen. I have two monitors, so there's a lot going on here. Um, so let me know if you can see my presentation. Yes. Okay, great. Good. Um, Perfect. Okay. Oh, I lost my notes. I'm going to just do one monitor, actually. There we go. Sorry. Sometimes those advancements just don't help at all, eh? <laughs> when I make the present, I'm just, is it okay if I just do present it this way?
There we go. Is that okay for everyone if I just present it like in PowerPoint like that? I don't think we see the screen yet, Lisa. Oh, sorry. There we go. There we go. Perfect. Okay, great. Awesome. So thank you guys all for having me. Um, I am a second year PhD student at the University of Ottawa. My uh, main focus in research is actually um, cognitive neuroscience, but I took the evaluation micro program this year under the supervision of Dr. Tim Aubrey and had the really amazing opportunity to um, conduct an evaluation on uh, CMHA Ottawa's 55 plus intensive case management program. Um, so I'm really excited to be here today uh, and I'm really excited to share the findings with you all. Um, so just some background information. As we, many of us know, uh, the aging population in Canada is growing more and more every year. Uh, in fact, according to the Canadian Institute for Health Information, the population of Canadians over the age of 65 will grow by 68% uh, over the next 20 years. Um, additionally, in 2012, it was reported about 130,000 Canadians over the age of 60 currently live with schizophrenia or, or other substance use disorder. Um, and as the population grows, this number is also estimated to grow as well. Um, there's not a whole lot of literature looking at how ICM specifically serves older adults with mental illness. However, general studies show that ICM improves client outcomes by reducing hospital admissions um, for those with severe mental health disorders uh, and also reducing the amount of time clients spend unhoused. Uh, in fact, a recent evaluation, I believe that happened last year, um, indicated that clients who are above the age of 55 were more likely to spend a longer time in ICM um, I use ICM as an abbreviation for intensive case management um, throughout this presentation. Um, They're more li likely to spend a longer time in ICM um, than those who are younger than 55. So uh, this is, uh, as um, Conrad has, has explained very nicely, this is a logic model, um, just kind of identifying um, the project uh, in terms of the ICM program generally and its, its main activities and outcomes. So the main takeaways here are uh, that case managers uh, connect clients with internal and external resources based on their goals through referrals, one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, and assessments. Um, and some intended short-term outcomes include increasing client connectedness to services uh, around Ottawa and identifying barriers to accessing mainstream services for these clients. Uh, and more long-term outcomes include increased independence, quality of life, social connectedness, and reducing barriers to social services. Oops. So the project that we did, um, case managers at CMHA Ottawa had identified a gap in the availability of ongoing services once the older client's mental health has stabilized. So in order to investigate why this might be the case, um, we conducted a needs assessment um, to one, identify the unique characteristics of ICM clients who are above the age of 55 who stay longer than five years in the program. Um, conducted a community scan to identify supports that are available for the client. So looking in the community and seeing what's really out there um, for, the, for these clients. And finally, determines any unmet needs and gaps in the services within and outside of CPH Ottawa. So we came up with four evaluation questions uh, for the study. Firstly, um, what are the characteristics of case management clients age 55 and over, particularly those who stay longer than five years in the program? So for this, we used um, some administrative data provided by CMHA Ottawa. Um, what community supports both within and outside of CMHA are currently available to clients? So this was the community scan that I had mentioned. Um, what are the inequities, gaps, and barriers in ass assessing uh, accessing services for these clients, and what solutions and recommendations would case managers and clients prioritize? So for these last two questions, we um, focused on focus groups uh, with case managers and interviews with clients. So our methods, um, like I mentioned, we had four methods of data collection, case in, uh, client interviews, case manager focus groups, administrative data analysis, and a community scan. Uh, administrative data included age, diagnosis, concurrent disorder status, dual diagnosis status, um, income, and any other chronic illnesses. 
Uh, one limitation, as you can probably note, uh, is that the sample size was quite small. We only had one semester to collect this data. Uh, and if I had more time, I would have loved to interview a few more clients and uh, get a few more, a little bit more information from our the case managers. <laughs> um, so firstly, uh, some of the results that we found um, and when looking at the administrative data, the most notable finding and the most notable difference that we found between those who uh, were in ICM for longer than five years and five years or less was their reports on the ca uh, cases of other chronic illnesses. So um, we did a chi-square goodness of fit test and it showed that people who have spent more than five years in the program are statistically more likely to report having a chronic illness than not, whereas um, people who spend five years or less, there's uh, not a real statistical difference if they report having other chronic illnesses or not. Um, so that was our main finding from our the administrative data. Uh, and to look at question two, what community supports are currently available? Um, we found, um, and on different domains, we found uh, several different resources, uh, accessible condos through rental su supplement programs, as well as different housing programs, such as Cornerstone Booth Residence, Kirkpatrick House. However, these options tend to have wait lists of up to five years and tend to not be wheelchair or walker accessible. Um, it's, it's, from what I understand, it, um, talking to some of the case managers, it's, it's quite difficult to get a uh, accessible unit. Um, and uh, so for food, there seem to be many options for food through food banks. Many food banks do grocery delivery and Meals on Wheels are sub is subsidized uh, for low income clients. Uh, additionally, paratranspo seems to be the main source of accessible transportation for older clients uh, with mobility issues. Um, additionally, senior specific healthcare programs like ODSP uh, and um, ODP and mental health services from institutions like the Royal, the Briere, uh, and CMHA Ottawa. And um, to address the question, what are the inequities, gaps, and barriers in accessing these services? Um, this is where we really get into the client uh, interviews and case manager focus groups. Um, so 60% of case managers and clients reported there being a challenge uh, in accessing suitable long-term housing for older adults. So um, there's problems with accessibility. Uh, some clients had a hard time getting their unit converted to be accessible because of space res restrictions. Um, a quote here uh, by a case manager says, uh, a lot of people end up in hospital. They're unable to discharge to homes because they're not set up for the accessibility needs of the clients. And there's a tendency to push clients out of hospital beds into the system where there's nowhere for them to go. 40% um, of case managers reported long-term care homes turning away clients with histories of addictions or behavioral problems, sort of furthering this limited um, this limited access to essential care and support services. So moving on to transportation, 60% um, of the case managers reported that community transportation services were overburdened and struggling to meet the needs of individuals, individuals requiring uh, transportation assistance. So case walk workers often found themselves providing transportation support, even if it falls outside of the scope of CMHA's uh, objectives. There's a need to book rides day in advance, uh, call very early in the morning. Um, and for clients who are lacking these organizational skills and for workers who uh, have time constraints, this can be very difficult to organize. Um, and additionally, uh, as Kim had mentioned, the uh, most of it is online booking. So there's added challenges that come with um, booking online and having uh, accessibility, ac accessible um, internet and that sort of thing. Okay, um, next, uh, accessing medical services becomes significantly more challenging for elderly clients or for those with mental health concerns. As their cases become more complex as they get older, they have more holistic care needs. So uh, cognitive challenges, mental health challenges, and physical disabilities that come with age. Um, some caseworkers have had experience where clients had been turned away from medical services due to addictions and behavioral problems. Um, and finally, this was a, a big report from our clients. The transition from ODSP to uh, OAS was noted to be very lengthy and detailed, 
requiring clients to provide extensive information. Um, so when you turn 65, you transfer from ODSP to old age security. Uh, and especially these complex forms can be very overwhelming and challenging, for particularly for those who have mental illness, problems with memory or limited resources. Uh, one client reported uh, it was a little bit difficult. I don't remember why, but going from one thing to another was quite tricky. Uh, it was difficult for me to get into the system and for a time I was not getting money from anywhere. And finally, um, what participants voiced a desire uh, in terms of uh, what solutions and recommendations uh, what they suggest. Participants really voice a desire for more centralized uh, and simplified process for accessing services, particularly for individuals dealing with multiple mental health challenges. Um, so creating comprehensive resource lists, possibly on the CMHA website, would be beneficial, especially if it includes specific resources tailored to seniors and their families. Uh, many caseworkers and clients identified it's crucial, it's crucial to recognize the wealth of wisdom and insight for that seniors bring, especially in navigating complex service systems. Um, by valuing and leveraging, leveraging their experiences, we can better support and empower senior clients. Um, and finally, uh, among all caseworkers, there seemed to be an emphasis on enrichment for seniors. Um, some people suggested language maintenance classes and social groups. So um, finally, moving on to our recommendations. Overall, the results from our report, it seems the main uh, barrier for accessing senior services that is sort of the disjointedness of the way that the system is designed, uh, especially for seniors with mental health and cognitive disabilities. As soon as uh, you start to um, uh, start having memory problems, it can become quite difficult navigating all these systems. Um, so we split the results into short-term and long-term. So short-term, um, we recommend uh, CMHA to form partnerships with psychogeriatric services, such as those at the Royal or the Briere, in order to make accessing services more seamless. Uh, and so the caseworkers have a little bit less research to do on their end. Um, and we, um, the Royal and the Briere can provide some, some really good resources. Um, next, establish a knowledge sharing platform uh, or list at CMHA for senior services and provide prioritizing, advocating for, and seeking uh, accessible subsidized housing and technology, technological literacy for seniors. And in terms of long-term um, recommendations, uh, we recommend to create a specific team at CMHA that specializes in care for seniors, um, specifically for transitioning from ODSP to OAS, but also for unique medical care um, and that sort of thing. Um, there's area opportunity for potential collaborations between meal services, such as Meals on Wheels, for subsidized meal care for seniors, um, advocacy for the fi for financially accessible in-home care for seniors who have unique medical needs, um, and there's opportunity for per um, potential partnerships there. And finally, um, I had a really great uh, email exchange with Kim about digital health equity, um, so promoting technolog technological literacy courses, Advocating, advocating for accessible technology, or even just making current services technology free. A lot of senior clients just don't want to be on technology. And I think there should be an option um, for them just to not do it at all. Um, and finally, knowledge mobilization and implications. This study will be used by CNHA to develop new programs for senior specific services, um, develop partnerships with senior services across the city. Uh, and especially for government advocacy for more accessible senior care for low-income clients with mental health diagnoses. Um, so thank you very much. My email's uh, right here, apos034 at uottawa.ca. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions, I really appreciate all your time. Thanks so much, Alyssa. Great, uh, great focus and a really needed area for us to be much more aware of as we all age. So it's actually in our benefits for all of us, some of us more closely than others. Um, so that um, ends our first theme. And the next theme is really looking at understanding the diverse needs of service users. And these two presentations are recorded presentations from our medical students who um, each did a specific area, which I'll talk about. Unfortunately, um, this is also scheduled when there's something to do with their classes today. And so they um, did a wonderful uh, recording and which we will share. 
So we have Nikki Akbarian, who is did a review of cardiovascular disease risk factors um, for clients that we serve the area, and for Kojo Niarko, who really interesting and very, very different, really looked at the implications of climate change on our clients and folks with uh, who are particularly vulnerable. So I think Christina is helping with that to get those presentations up and on the screen. And I just wanted to welcome folks who might have just uh, joined us. There's been some difficulties with the link. We apologize for that, but welcome those who missed our earlier welcome. And just a reminder, folks, that if you do have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to put them in the chat, and then we can have some time in the end uh, to address. Um, for the video presentations, um, our presenters aren't here today, but we will uh, circle the questions back with them, and then we'll get the answers for the final report. So I will start Nikki's video here. Hi everyone, my name is Nikki and I'm a first year medical student at the University of Ottawa. And today I'm gonna to be presenting my research findings on the review of cardiovascular disease risk factors and outcomes of individuals experiencing homelessness and serious mental illness. So for a bit of background, according to Statistics Canada, 235,000 people experience homelessness per year. Studies have shown cardiovascular disease is 2.86 times more common in the homeless population and is associated with increased mortality, meaning that they have worse outcomes than the non-homeless population. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, serious mental illnesses are mental disorders causing serious functional impairments, the most common being major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia, which are the three that I focused on in my review. Uh, the duration of serious mental illness and cardiovascular disease is positively associated, meaning that the longer someone experiences serious mental illness, the more cardiovascular disease risk factors that they had. Again, similarly to homelessness, cardiovascular disease is associated with increased mortality ratios within this population. So the purpose of the study was to really shed light on the fact that this population has elevated risk factors for cardiovascular disease and that they have poor outcomes. Uh, by doing this research, I'm really trying to get a better understanding as to why that's the case uh, and hopes to instill some change and to really advocate for this population. So in terms of methods, two searches were conducted using the PubMed database, the first being for homelessness and cardiovascular disease, and the second being for serious mental illness and cardiovascular disease. Both of the searches were filtered for papers that included females. Uh, it's also really important to note that the initial purpose of the study was actually to look specifically at women with serious mental illness and homelessness, but there was a lack of papers within this specific subgroup, and it really led to the removal of a sex-specific search. Uh, this really highlights the dire need for research around cardiovascular health of women specifically who are experiencing serious mental illness and homelessness, especially since this group does experience unique risk factors and outcomes of cardiovascular disease. Um, so individuals experiencing homelessness have higher rates of both traditional and non-traditional cardiovascular disease risk factors. The traditional risk factors include uh, hypertension, diabetes, smoking, and, and dyslipidemia. So the homeless population were, were found to have significantly elevated rates of hypertension when compared to non-homeless individuals. Additionally, the hypertension is often underdiagnosed and undertreated, which leads to poor blood pressure control and cardiovascular stress. Moving on to tobacco use, um, the second leading cause of death related to smoking is due to heart problems. So that really does show the negative impact smoking does have on the heart. Uh, the Healthcare for the Homeless user survey identified that 73% um, of homeless populations identified as current smokers, and this is a much higher rate than individuals who are not homeless. Moving on to lipids, a New York-based study found that 82% of the homeless population sampled had hyperlipidemia. So the poor lipid profile can be accounted for by fewer opportunities for individuals who are homeless to make sound nutritional choices. Uh, the dietary patterns of homeless women show that most of their caloric intakes were from foods of high saturated fats and simple carbohydrates. It can be quite difficult for this population to achieve healthy food options. Uh, research has shown that on average, healthy food options cost nearly twice as much as unhealthy options. Uh, 
Additionally, the meals provided at homeless shelters were investigated, and it was found that they were deficient in the amounts of fiber and vitamins while containing excess sugars and fats. Moving on to the non-traditional risk factors of cardiovascular disease, these include HIV, drug use, cocaine use, and chronic stress. So HIV has been shown to produce immune activations, which negatively impact the heart and cause elevated risks of cardiovascular disease. Homeless individuals have higher rates of HIV when compared to the non-homeless population. And uh, this can be due to an increased risky sexual behaviors or increased use of injections. So speaking of injections, IV drug use is more common within individuals who experience homelessness, and it can lead to infective endocarditis, which is the inflammation of the lining inside the heart, and um, this can obviously cause cardiovascular disturbances as well. Moving on to cocaine use, so cocaine use is also associated with cardiovascular disturbances. A study in investigating individuals who experience homelessness in Toronto found that 29% of the homeless population um, admitted to using cocaine in the past 12 months, which again is higher than the general population. And finally, moving on to chronic stress. So individuals who experience homelessness have elevated stress rates. Stress leads to the release of a hormone called CRH, and this hormone negatively impacts the cardiovascular system and also does play a role in mental illness. So really speaking of mental illness, to bridge the gap, uh, there's a disproportionately elevated rate of mental illness within that uh, homeless population. Uh, so this moves us on to the second part of our search, which is looking at homeless, uh, which is looking at cardiovascular disease and serious mental illness. So patients with serious mental illness have increased risk factors of cardiovascular disease, such as smoking, unhealthy diet, and metabolic disturbances. So starting by looking at bipolar disorder, 33% of deaths of those who experience bipolar disorder is due to cardiovascular disease. This could be due to many things, uh, one of which is the P2X7 gene. So this gene is associated with the cognitive symptoms of bipolar disorder and has also been linked to strokes and heart attacks as well. Additionally, antipsychotic medication used for patients with bipolar disorder has been linked to weight gain, hyperlipidemia, hyperglycemia, and elevated QT intervals, all of which are cardiovascular disease risk factors. Moving on to major depressive disorder, individuals with this disorder are more likely to experience cardiovascular disease than those without. Uh, this may be attributed to the biological mar markers such as the HSCRP, which is an, an inflammatory biomarker that is associated both with major depressive disorder and cardiovascular disease. Antidepressants have also been linked to several cardiovascular risk factors such as obesity, dyslipidemia, hypertension, and diabetes. Uh, finally, we will be speaking on schizophrenia. So research has shown that individuals with schizophrenia have disproportionately elevated rates of developing cardiovascular disease. In addition to the negative impacts of weight gain, insulin resistance, hyperlipidemia caused by antipsychotic medications, common medications used for schizophrenia, such as clozapine, have been associated with reduced left, venti vent left ventricular ejection fraction, uh, which really highlight the stress that this, these medications do put on the heart. So finally, to sum it all up, um, research has shown that those who are homeless are likely to have mental illness and vice versa. So having both serious mental illness and being homeless further elevates risk factors for cardiovascular disease and for outcomes. Addressing a single factor, such as addressing homelessness or serious mental illness independently, does not significantly decrease the risk factors of cardiovascular disease. So a study showed that only providing housing to, pa to patients who have both serious mental illness and experience homelessness um, did not significantly decrease the cardiovascular risk factors. So this really highlights that both homelessness and serious mental illness should be addressed within this population for, for better cardiovascular disease health outcomes. Uh, so patients with uh, serious mental illness and homelessness may face many barriers to prevention and treatment. Uh, these patients are less likely to be screened for risk factors and prescribed medication, as well as receive treatments. A study found that the homeless individuals were less likely to receive coronary artery bypass grafts after experiencing a heart attack compared to non-homeless individuals. This population is also more likely to experience prejudice and negative attitudes by healthcare workers. This leads to poor communication, delays in diagnostic procedures, treatments, and a decreased willingness of this population to seek medical care. 
Research has shown that this population has decreased adherence to medication. However, it's really important to not necessarily put the blame on the population themselves, but to really highlight the barriers they may face, such as financial barriers, having competing interests, such as needing to find shelter, or even the inability to take uh, certain medications as instructed. For example, some medications need to be taken with large and regular meals, which this group may not have the luxury of. Uh, finally, I wanted to speak a little bit about the sex differences. So despite removing the gender-specific search for women with serious mental illness and homelessness due to the lack of studies, um, I did come across certain sex differences in the studies that were found. Um, so certain cardiovascular disease risk factors are gender associated. So women have 1.7 times the risk of major depressive disorder than men and experience longer depressive episodes. Research have, has also shown different adverse effects to psychotropic medication between men and women. Additionally, risk factors for heart disease in women are often underestimated and cardiovascular disease is often underdiagnosed. This may be attributed to the atypical symptoms of cardiovascular disease, which women often experience, such as jaw pain, abdominal pain, and nausea. So to conclude, it is evident that individuals experiencing serious mental illness and homelessness often face increased risk factors to cardiovascular disease and have poorer outcomes. It's imperative to take further steps to really dismantle these barriers that these individuals face to provide better health, health outcomes. There should be more screening, easier access to medication, healthcare services, and even the ability to make healthier choices. Organizations such as the CMHA nursing team really help to decrease the barriers for this population to seek medical care. It's important to really give presentations like the following to educate staff and to try to dismantle the barriers and the biases um, that may exist against this population. Um, in terms of uh, knowledge distribution and really further outcomes, I think it's really important to improve health literacy and health information for this population themselves to really allow them to make healthier choices and to recognize uh, signs of cardiovascular disease and want to seek medical attention. It's important to put into play risk reduction strategies, um, such as smoking cessation, and to really provide multidisciplinary care, um, including physicians, nurses, social workers, psychologists, and more, to really address the complex needs of these patients. Finally, the changes in the trajectory taken by this research due to the lack of research surrounding women uh, really brings attention to women being historically underrepresented underrepresented in research and really shows the dire need for further studies investigating cardiovascular disease of women experiencing homelessness and serious mental illness, especially since women face unique risk factors and symptoms of cardiovascular disease. In terms of knowledge mobilization, uh, so this presentation is available to CMHA staff and to the community. Uh, the full research paper will also be available for the agency to really understand the unique um, healthcare needs of clients and to really help support training and raise awareness. Thank you so much for listening. If there are any questions, my email is down below and I would be happy to uh, hear any comments or questions. Thank you so much. That's a great presentation from Nikki. And um, so the next presentation is from Kojo, which is looking at uh, climate change considerations for this population. Sorry, give me one second here. I can't seem to play it, okay. There we go. You all know climate is. Hey, everybody. My name is Kojo. I'm 
Christian Medical Student at the University of Ottawa. And today I'm going to be doing a presentation on climate change considerations and best practices for individuals who are vulnerably housed and experiencing mental health conditions. So as I'm sure that you all know, the climate is changing and there's a disproportionate impact of climate change on individuals who are vulnerable. A lot of these individuals who already have different challenges in society that have a lot of these challenges exacerbated as a result of climate change. So before starting, I think it's important that we can define a couple of Hey, Christina, do you want me to have a go? Okay, give me one more try. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, whenever I share it, it's in my sharing is Okay. Okay, I might have to share it like that. Is everybody able to see this version? Unless, Marianne, do you want to try it on your screen? I think this is good. It's fine. Okay. It's a little blurry, but that could be my eyesight. <laughs> okay, let me do it. I have it downloaded. Sorry, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. Today, I'm going to be doing a presentation on climate change considerations and best practices for individuals who are vulnerably housed and experiencing mental health conditions. So as I'm sure. We seem to have lost sound on Kojo. Vulnerably housed, and this is an umbrella term that includes individuals who are in three main, like different categories. You have individuals who are experiencing absolute homelessness. So these are people who are living without shelter or maybe in an emergency shelter. And then you also have people who are more like hidden homeless. And that means maybe you're living in a more unstable situation, such as a car or on a friend's couch. So you won't be visibly seen as homeless often by other people, but you are still in a more unstable situation. And then, of course, we have relative homelessness, and these are all people who are at risk of losing their home. And it's important just to, I guess, think about the stratification here, because many individuals who lie somewhere along the spectrum are still going to be impacted by climate change, often in slightly different ways. But a lot of literature doesn't always consider individuals in all these categories. And the main focus is on people who are experiencing absolute homelessness. Another very important key term is climate change, and that's defined as long-term changes in the climate that are otherwise known as global warming. It's, it's a little bit more than more, just warming. And then we also have adverse weather events. These are acute weather events that can include tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, and snowstorms. So throughout this study, there were three primary objectives. The first objective was just to identify the impact of climate change on individuals who are vulnerably housed and experiencing mental health conditions. And this is what was conducted through the literature review and after which the goal is to be able to create interventions that are intended to reduce harm and promote health for the population. And hopefully after creating these interventions, they can then be implemented. And then evaluation of these, um, these efforts can be conducted so that we can improve things in the future. I just want to take you through the methods that I use throughout this presentation. So I began with formulating the research question, which is, what is the impact of climate change on individuals who are vulnerably housed with mental health conditions? after which I conducted a literature search using PubMed, Embase, Medline, and PsycInfo using key subheadings and keywords. Some of the main ones were um, climate change, adverse weather events, um, mental health conditions, and then different keywords for, the, for those same subheadings, synonyms, as well as often just breaking down different mental health conditions to, to capture those items in the search. After completing the literature search, I had 119 results in which I screened their titles and abstracts for relevance. And then I had 27 results left over that I conducted full text review on. And I had a detailed inclusion and exclusion criteria that I used to decide what to include. And there were only five papers that were included in the final, the final literature study. And like after, after selecting these five papers and then extracted the data, I began to write the paper. 
So now I just want to take you through some of the key themes that I found throughout the literature. I tried to really just synthesize things and focus on key takeaways. And a lot more of the detailed things from each paper are outlined in the, the full literature, literature review that I wrote. So the first key finding is that increased exposure to climate and adverse weather events leads to um, leads to a lack, a lack of shelter and inability to escape from climate change, as well as more individuals becoming vulnerably housed. So beginning with the theme of the lack of shelter, there are often heightened exposures to cold, heat, and natural disasters because people are unable to escape because they, they obviously don't have you know, a home or somewhere to go. And as a result, this really heightens the mental, in, mental health impact on them. They also often have an inability to escape from the weather for very similar, very similar reasons. And as a result, that also heightens the impact. And then they also found that as a result of adverse weather events, people's homes and shelter can be destroyed. And this destruction and really just creating situations of instability often pushes people into situations of vulnerable housing. So we really have an unfortunate cycle where adverse weather events are creating more individuals who are vulnerable housed, and these individuals then suffer more from further adverse weather events. So it really is something that we need to stop at its root. And another key theme that was found throughout the papers was less access to public health messaging and resources for coping. So, the first, I guess, key part of this is that a lot of the means of communication are very inaccessible. So if we think about the ways that we often find out about emergencies or things that are going on, it's often through our cell phones or maybe through the television or the radio, internet. But if you're unfortunately an individual who's lonely housed or maybe you don't have access to these means, you really don't know what's going on. And as a result of not knowing what's going on, you're just a lot more vulnerable um, to these events and as a result it has a bigger impact on your physical and your mental health and then additionally um, individuals in this community often have inadequate resources to prepare and cope for adverse weather events so the ability to really migrate and escape these adverse weather events is limited by your economic you know, I mean, your social means and as a result if you are as lacking in some of these means you're, you're just going to suffer a lot more and additionally a lot of the a lot of the methods that the government has for planning for disasters often does not include individuals who are on the house. For example, um, oftentimes there may be like a contingency plan. Let's say we have an earthquake. When when we have an earthquake, there will be certain alerts that are sent out at certain times, or maybe um, individuals in certain locations will be notified or curing certain signals. There are there's often procedures and processes that are in place, but Many of these do not explicitly account for individuals who are vulnerable housed or experiencing mental health conditions. And as a result, they're often left out and they will um, have worse outcomes. And another really important finding from the literature was increased psychological stress and decreased mental health outcomes for, for these individuals. So one key reason for that was there was pre-existing trauma that people have that can be triggered by climate change. So when you have um, adverse weather events like tornadoes, hurricanes, et cetera, you may often have some loud noises that are associated with that. And it's often, I guess, the more, um, more psychological things such as a sense of chaos or disorganization or maybe a loss of privacy. And when you have all these things, it can really trigger a lot of people who may have experienced um, some of these things before in other circumstances. And we also have five other um, key findings. And these are, just changes in mental health related outcomes that they found in a study in Australia. So this was a mixed method study and they conducted surveys on individuals who were both vulnerably housed as well as service providers. And one, one the key findings were, firstly, you have a decline in mental health. So 36.9% of individuals experienced um, worsened mental health status. We also had a 25.5% increase in drug and alcohol consumption an 18.5% increase in domestic violence, 26.5% increase in arguments, fights, and violence, as well as a 30.8% increase in overall weather-related trauma. And so overall, you just see that many things that are directly linked to your mental health get impacted with climate change. So it's very important that we keep an eye on these, these problems and just try and intervene to try and mitigate them. And this was a very 
interesting finding and it was a, a perspective that I wasn't explicitly looking for when conducting the paper, but I do think it is very interesting. So they found that whether related changes in mental health status, sorry, they found that um, there are often changes in mental health status that reflect um, changes in the weather and also changes in substance use patterns that are impacted by the weather. So they found that um, cold and wet weather is often associated with depression and lifetime drug use. They found that warm weather was associated with alcohol use disorder and wet weather was associated with al al antisocial personality disorder. But of course, the moment, like the momentary change in like the temperature or like the amount of precipitation is not actually linked to individuals um, lifetime experience of these conditions, but it really just shows that some of the diagnostic methods may be potentially confounded by the weather state. And so it's just important to understand that if we have a state, a situation of drastically changing climate, we need to ensure that our methods of diagnosing and even assessing people for certain problems are validated in, the, in these new situations. And although they couldn't figure out a full reason for this, there were a couple suggested mechanisms. They thought that the weather impacts self-reporting due to changes in emotional states. So it may change the way that you frame past events in your life and either result um, impacting, I guess, your self-reporting self, your self -reporting and what they end up diagnosing you as. And then there's also um, cold weather decreasing mood and resulting in questionnaires being more frequently positive for mental health conditions and drug use disorders. And I think another another very important finding was the increased vulnerability of youth to all these problems. So they found that there was a sense of climate-related distress and pre-trauma syndromes that exist in the youth. So with climate-related distress, this really means that a lot of youth um, just have, a, have like an underlying sense of anxiety related to the climate and the direction that things are going in. I think a lot of this stems from the fact that as younger people, it's not necessarily a problem that we really created, but it is very urgent in our current time that we intervene to stop things before it you know, gets to a point of no return. And so I think that really creates a lot of stress for people. And there's also a phenomenon called pre-trauma syndromes, and these are just defined as a lot of times um, certain events can be, like I guess, some kind of triggers for individuals with um, like PTSD or related syndromes. And they also noted themes of hopelessness, powerlessness, and emotional distress as being very notable in the youth. And they also found that a lot of climate change as well as like acute weather events can interrupt people's social cohesion and also lead to feelings of social isolation. And we kind of saw the impact of this a little bit during the pandemic. And I think as a result, it's really important that we can prevent it because a lot of these impact, a lot of these phenomena have impacts like very far down the line as well. And I guess lastly, they also found that there were disruptions in mental health care for pre-existing conditions. So um, in, a, in a study that they conducted in, in the FEMA villages after Hurricane Katrina, so these were temporary housing shelters that were created after, after individuals were displaced because of the hurricane. They found that when people were in these vulnerable house situations, um, they didn't have access to a lot of their previous, a lot of their previous mental health care. It was interesting about this is that within these villages, they did have mental health practitioners, but they just found that people were a little bit disrupted and just generally weren't, um, weren't utilizing these services. And as a result, there were also the development of new mental health conditions and the worsening of people's pre-existing conditions. So just to conclude um, the main results, the, the study found that individuals in vulnerable housing situations who have mental health conditions are more susceptible to a lot of climate-related harms. And the main reasons for this are, of course, increased exposure to the climate relative to most individuals in society and not being able to escape or to take refuge from the climate in, in a lot of situations. And there's also poor public health communication that doesn't allow people to adequately prepare. We also have a large impact on individuals' mental health outcomes. It has been proven through studies. However, there is a need for more studies to further elucidate that. And then we also have we also have the fact that interventions and diagnoses may need to be revalidated, especially when considering our new climate situations. And I think another thing that was very, very apparent throughout the study was the large gap in the literature as 
oftentimes um, most studies really just didn't consider the impact of mental health on individuals who are both vulnerably housed and experiencing mental health conditions. And I think that given like given the urgency of the situation and the fact that climate change is something that everybody will be facing, it's very important that we fund more studies to, on this on this subject. So now just to proceed with the recommendations and implications. So based on the findings in the literature review, these are some things that we think could um, really just serve, serve to help the community. So I think first and foremost, we need to conduct more high quality studies with an emphasis on intersectionality. As I mentioned earlier, there wasn't much literature on the subject in general. However, even within the literature that was included, there wasn't any emphasis on how this impacts people of maybe a different racial background or maybe um, members of the LGBTQ community or really just um, any communities that are often disproportionately impacted because of, I guess, social inequities. I think it's important that we consider that. And we also think it's very important that we present prevent service interruptions during natural disasters, especially for the youth, because youth are just have been proven to be more vulnerable to having certain conditions worsening in these in these disasters. We also want to increase access to air conditioners via ODSP and other funding. This was something that we targeted because, especially in Ottawa, and the fact that um, it's often getting quite a lot warmer in the summers, we need to make sure that people are people are just protected more and not being exposed to very hot weather for very long periods of time. We also think it's important that the funding reflects the climate dependent needs. So it's important just to be flexible and, and really just um, allowing the funding that we have to mirror the needs based on the climate. We also think that distributing cell phones to people would ensure that individuals in the community are up to date with what's going on and have just have a chance to really prepare and mitigate some of the climate-related stress that they may be experiencing. And we also want to enhance emergency mental health supports. We want to enhance harm reduction strategies because we have seen that changes in the climate can impact individuals like substance use. And we just want to assess um, the climate preparedness for emergencies, whether that's both within the organization or even on a governmental level. So thank you so much for listening to this presentation. I am very sorry that I wasn't able to be there in person. However, if you do have any questions, um, feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Great presentations from our future physicians, which is just wonderful to see. Um, and so our last um, themed area is looking at implementing cutting edge evaluations in community mental health. And the first presentation is on creating and implementing an evaluation framework for recovery colleges, presented by Christina Muchler, who's our postdoctoral fellow here at CMHA, and Rebecca Rutland, who's one of our peer support workers here. Awesome. Thank you, Donna. Let me just get this set up, okay. Oh. All right. Rebecca, where are you? There you are, okay. Perfect, okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here with you today. Um, I'm Dr. Christina Mutchler. I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at CMHA Ottawa, um, and I'm joined by uh, Rebecca Rutland. Uh, Rebecca, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Rebecca Rutland. I'm a peer support worker at CMHA. I've been in my role here for about five years, and a few years ago, I had the opportunity to sort of expand what I'm doing and step in to support our recovery college uh, project that got running things greatly to the work of Jacqueline Ball, my program manager. So that's been a really amazing adventure. And Christina jumped in um, courageously to support our evaluation efforts uh, a little while ago. And so we're really happy to be here today and talk a little bit about what we've been doing. Awesome, thank you, Rebecca. All right. 
So if you're if you're not familiar with recovery colleges, um, recovery college is a strength based recovery oriented program for individuals with mental illness that prioritizes an educational rather than a clinical approach. Um, so within recovery colleges, educational courses on health, um, mental health related topics, wellness topics are provided to individuals in the community, um, their carers and mental health professionals. The central tenet of Recovery College is co-production, meaning that at every stage of the program, mental health professionals collaborate with individuals with lived experience to co-design and co-deliver courses. Okay. So I'll jump in. So history of our recovery college, we received some initial funding from CMHA National in 2021. And the first step we took was to form a recovery college advisory committee. And that was to guide our process of forming the college. All the members were current and former CMHA service users or CMHA Ottawa. So we had myself a peer worker, uh, Jacqueline Baller, recovery college program manager, as well as the service users who all brought in some very, um, some very related skills and abilities and talents that they could use to support development. And we started out with um, a peer worker, so myself doing a one a one day a week job with this. So to move forward with um, offering our learning opportunities, our initial course offerings were borrowed from the CMHA Winnipeg Manitoba Wellness Learning Center. We also secured consultation from the peer worker at CMHA Winnipeg Manitoba, our peer worker and program manager who had led the development of those courses, um, as well as some mentorship opportunities. So since we launched, um, we have had 39 unique courses. We've developed six co-productions that have developed six unique courses. We've had collaborative work with other community organizations that have resulted in 11 courses delivered. Uh, we launched in January 2022 with one course a week. It was then in virtual format only due to pandemic-related constraints. And since then, we've moved to either in-person or hybrid delivery and continued with one course a week, and we're now using the semester system. We've been able to undertake our own co-productions uh, since spring 2022 with the Nature and Wellness series, and that's continued to expand with a new partner. We've had community building courses developed in a collaboration with our housing peer worker and our housing team, and that's to support our recently housed service users in building naturally occurring connected communities. And we're working with a community nonprofit farm, Just Food, um, to launch a four-part co-produced series to support well-being and food security. And most recently, and very exciting, we partnered with three area service providers, so the African Caribbean Black Wellness Resource Center, Youth Services Bureau, and Sapphire at Upstream, to serving youth to offer wellness and opportunities for leadership skills for racialized youth. And we're actually working on site at the ACB Wellness Center, which is really also in keeping with the Recovery College model sort of public spoke. So we've been successful with some funding applications and that's allowed us to keep building and, and recently secure the, the means to offer better hybrid course delivery as well as ease up our administrative load with a better, um, way more efficient registration system. And that'll allow us to open doors to far more uh, service users and members of the community. So currently, there are no best practices outlined in the research literature for how to evaluate recovery colleges. Um, and this is a really important next step for recovery college in order to make sure that the program is being delivered uh, with effectiveness. So the purpose of the present project was to review um, published studies in academic literature evaluating recovery colleges, also reviewing best practices in evaluation science, and then synthesizing those two areas um, in order to create an evaluation framework that can be used by the recovery college at CMHA Ottawa and also uh, recovery colleges around the world. So our um, evaluation framework that we created that we're gonna be talking about today involves three different steps. The first is a formative evaluation um, that asks the questions, is the program feasible, appropriate, and acceptable? Um, step two is an implementation evaluation. So it asks the questions, is the program being implemented as intended? 
And does the program have fidelity to the model? And then lastly is um, the outcome evaluation that uh, most folks are probably somewhat familiar with, where we're asking the question, does the program impact the intended outcomes? Oh, Rebecca, you're muted. Okay, thanks. The air conditioner kicked off and looked very loud. So exploring how involvement with recovery colleges impacts lives and perspectives and views of recovery and change um, helps us sort of look through the CHI model. So looking through connectedness, hope and optimism, identity, meaning and empowerment and that framework of recovery. And that can reveal how the college is sort of functional congruity with the model's intention. So looking at engagement with services, measuring interpersonal and community connection, feelings of inclusion, decrease in stigma, increase in sense of hope and future, self-esteem and confidence, sense of self, uh, as well as sense of purpose, contribution, feelings of inclusion, meaning, levels of self-determination, people's ability to self-advocate, negotiate for and navigate resources, uh, building resilience, problem solving, asking for help, inclusion of people bringing in more non-clinical and non-emergency non-crisis supports to support their recoveries and maintain wellness, as well as moving towards their hopes and dreams. And those are really kind of, it's a lot of, but really valuable overarching themes for, um, for information gathering. And of course, an area for really enhanced attention is, attention is that of co-production, because that is, of course, at the outset, it's also a novel concept for service users to shift into um, the role of participating and designing a delivering a service. So sort of paying it extra attention in co-production, educating people about this is, I found that to be really critical. The non-traditional nature of co-production is difficult for people to kind of grapple with. And it's less about product and then it is about a very complex process that really uniquely embeds service user input. So ensuring that significant attention and adequate resource allocation is made in educating and supporting our students to feel informed and prepared, confident and valued in joining co-production uh, is really, really critical. And then measuring this helps us understand where there's success and perhaps even more importantly, where there's less positive results and then we can carry those lessons learned forward. Um, so another area looking at too as well is how is higher, like power and hierarchy and the relationships between the learned and the experts in those co-production relationships shifting. Uh, so also flexibility and support in our evaluation activities can be achieved by offering <clears throat> options. So in-person, virtual, telephone attendance, ensuring that sites are accessible, offering to do interviews over several sessions because people that might have symptoms might be getting tired, meeting in the community or at partner sites, using surveys that can be completed at people's convenience, um, inviting people to bring in a support person or support animal, making sure there's a comfort guideline among group members for focus groups that housekeeping is addressed, and, and being open to unanticipated changes in plans and amounts of times needed for interactions, interviews and um, focus groups can take much longer than anticipated, and providing briefs and debriefs to our interviewees, so ensuring that there's also a level of rapport building and trust before formal interview starts and being open to questions. And some final items to highlight that I've noticed, this is sort of lived experience lens, um, the confidentiality and then knowledge mobilization. There's been for many, these have been for many service users, a source of frustration and confusion. So having really upfront and ongoing conversations about provisions and limits to confidentiality and kind of any evaluations and research is really important to encourage people in feeling safe to offer honest feedback and feel really respected in, in doing so, as well as with knowledge mobilization, providing summaries of what you're gathering and offering means of knowledge transfer to people specific to those who've been instrumental in its generation. That really honors inclusivity because sometimes that sort of break occurs when people participate and they offer the information, but they don't necessarily kind of gets disjointed when they don't understand where and how it's being used and what that value is. And when people do understand that value, they're going to be far more likely to provide that information. Okay, next. So while co-production is the most critical feature of recovery colleges, it can also be very challenging to implement. So to support relationship development and collegiality among students and learned experts, 
Again, uh, using a comfort agreement, renegotiating this as needed at each co-production is helpful. And this ensures the participants know the rules of the road and it provides agreed upon guidelines to refer to in the event of conflict or confusion. Professional experts are coached and we have good conversation in advance regarding co-production and expectations and their roles. And everyone's knowledge has equal value in recovery college. That's one of the foundational principles. And those using a service are in one of the best places to help design it. So we really highlight that. And co-productions are, co are facilitated by the peer worker attached to the program. Sometimes the program manager may join. Icebreakers are used to create a comfortable atmosphere and create a bit of comfort among group members. Participants are encouraged and supported to use their wellness tools and grounding tools. Again, we offer debriefs. People are encouraged to be active in joining in, but it's okay. You know, we certainly affirm that people are okay to kind of sit and be quiet and take time to join in if they need to. A variety of ways to participate and contribute or offer. So people could research information, they can find graphics, they can use their own stories or offer resources. And emerging conflicts do happen. So those are addressed really swiftly and require a pretty um, good level of skill and really a lot of respect for individual sensitivities. We try to use very much a learn from experience perspective with conflict uh, um, and really valuing the differing of worldviews and emphasizing how that helps us learn. But we try to create a very inclusive and diverse learning environment that really is embedded in all of our approaches and activities. Um, and again, highlighting the sense of connectedness and the shared purpose overall really seems to alleviate some of that and create that sense of inclusion. So accessibility can be a really common barrier for our recovery college students and um, one of the factors in dropout and non-attendance. So the topic of a co-production and any background information, just a little bit of sort of how we do this. We provide framing questions to each participant in advance. We make sure those are in an accessible format. Meeting times are set by majority availability. We take into account transportation and offer a hybrid when possible. Expectations for participation or contribution are explained. We answer questions and offer discussion on that. We have an accessible space that's been reserved for Recovery College. Uh, and we just, again, discuss the needs in advance with any participants to make sure they'll be welcome and prepare that space in advance. So people with any mobility needs or otherwise feel comfortable when they get here. And we also, people are welcome to bring a support person, including a CMHA worker. Uh, so finally, offer honorariums. In order to honor people's time, this is a very important part of Recovery College is making sure that people with bringing in their lived experience feel as appreciated as somebody who's being paid for their time. So honorariums or certificates, letter of achievements are being phased in for co-productions. We have started with honorariums. We offer bus tickets, um, yeah. snacks and beverages can be available. We have a Recovery College welcome package that includes a letter and a frequently uh, asked questions document. Student guidelines are provided. And we also offer, finally, a co-production evaluation tool, and that's an either hard copy or by online or survey link for closing our sessions. And, and the gathering of info, the importance of gathering this information is explained. So all of that is done in as accessible a format as we can. Um, and so recovery colleges also need to negotiate their relationships with their host organization. And this can be especially challenging when the recovery college operates within a setting that is dominated by the medical model, as this model is more hierarchical and thus may be more resistant to embracing co-production and recovery-based approaches. So ideally, as the recovery-oriented culture is created, it can then feed back to create a more collaborative lived experience-led culture within the broader organization, start kind of mobilizing that transformative change that we all wanna to see towards a far more equitable mental health care system. So once the initial challenges and the development of the recovery college have been assessed for and addressed, the next step is to look at the implementation of the recovery college. Um, so this can be done through a fidelity assessment, so fidelity to the recovery college model. So I just wanted to show um, this chart here that outlines um, the different aspects of recovery college that need to be in place in order for the model to be um, delivered to fidelity. So this has actually um, been, been developed, researched, and studied um, by uh, Tony and colleagues, and it's called the Recollect Checked Checklist. 
Um, so these can be evaluated by um, researchers, uh, the recovery college themselves, or um, outside um, evaluators. The last step in our framework is evaluating the outcomes. So first of all, we need to know that the recovery college has overcome its challenges in implementation. It's being implemented consistently with that um, in line with the model and the values. And once that is done, then outcomes can be assessed. So a number of outcomes for recovery colleges have been uh, documented in the literature. These uh, include changes for students of the recovery college, changes for staff, as well as changes in services and society. So a number of co common evaluation methods include um, like free text information gathered from open-ended surveys, one-on-one um, -on -one interviews or focus groups, student surveys using uh, validated measures, as well as administrative and archival data. Um, so evaluation of recovery college is a new area of study with no evaluation framework currently in place. And the present review provides a framework that can be used by other recovery colleges. Rebecca, do you want to finish up quickly? Absolutely. Um, so many RC's recovery colleges have expanded the ways that recovery colleges operate to include some you know, non co produced learning opportunities and support opportunities that are valuable but don't necessarily reflect that kind of core principle of co production. And this, again, is a central tenet of recovery colleges um, principles and functioning of embedding lived experience that is kind of you know, equal but different to learned experience and again sort of creating that that overall shift um, in mental health care. So co-production and fidelity to this is a pretty critical feature of recovery college as a central element and that's why it's important to kind of maintain that as a central feature of evaluation. Um, so in terms of what is practical about that, you know, first looking towards funding. So evaluation of recovery colleges does provide the evidence that's required to secure the funding needed to expand further. And more funding will support the thought that the very, very positive life altering benefits uh, that, are, that are created through co-production and the courses that result. And as service users take a greater lead in their well-being through participating and learning and contributing, it's you know the load on other services lessen and the mental health care shifts. Um, and data gathered can lead to program improvements and efficiency is enhanced by understanding what is and what is not working well. And overall co-production sort of eases up and becomes easier as we understand how it works more and whether it's working and where it's not working. Um, so while it is admittedly like a resource heavy, a complex and lengthy undertaking, it's also the vehicle by which transformation in the mental health care system towards an equalized value of lived experience with that of learned expertise can occur. And working together, service users and providers are challenged in redefining roles and individual and collective understandings of what mental health, um, wellness and recovery mean. And the power and balance traditionally inherent to the biomedical model is shifted. Ultimately, this acts to support the very original social justice aims of the community, community, sorry, consumer survival movements that are kind of the deepest roots of recovery college. And these lie in the model's intention to embed the social and personal model of recovery in mental health care and value differences based on mental health experiences. So without evaluating recovery colleges in keeping with fidelity to co-production, a critical and very defining feature and purpose of the effort can be undermined. So finally, there's also a very growing research body and movement attesting to the very necessary inclusion of people with lived experience in all functions and level of mental health care including research and recovery college and fidelity to co-production and inclusion in all its aspects from course production to evaluation contributes to this and speaks to very common goals of a compassionate, very inclusive mental health care system and services. That's it. Thanks everyone. Thank you. You're muted, Donna.
sorry, something came out and blocked everything. Anyway, um, I wanted to introduce Elise McCall, who's a PhD student from the University of Ottawa, and um, Ali Hayes, an MA student from the University of Waterloo. We're going to be presenting on community building with Housing First clients. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you, Donna. I'm just getting our presentation set up here. Um, so good morning, and I guess almost good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Alethea, and I'm joined today by my colleague Elise. And so today we have the pleasure of providing you with an update on the status of our developmental evaluation, which tests the pilot implementation of a community building intervention for housing first clients. So this research is being conducted at the Center for Research on Educational and Community Services at the University of Ottawa in partnership with CMHA Ottawa and Options Bytown. So we're excited to present to you today on behalf of our research team, which also includes Dr. Tim Obrey, Dr. Christina Mutchler, and Linda Wood. So just a, a quick background um, with respect to um, this, this project. Um, so as many of you are familiar with this, as Holly mentioned, so this is um, you know, partnering with Housing First programs, looking at the notion of, of citizenship and also how to incorporate social prescribing and building community into these programs. So as, as many are familiar with, um, Housing First was developed by Dr. Sam Semperis in the 1990s to support people with serious mental illness who are homeless to move directly from the streets into housing of their choosing without any preconditions. Um, and so research on Housing First has shown that participants leave homelessness sooner than people in usual homelessness services as they also take more savings stable housing over time. Um, what's also been found in this research is that while Housing First has addressed people's immediate and long-term housing needs, there's not as much evidence to show that it's superior to other services at improving long-term health and social outcomes, such as improved community integration, recovery, and community functioning. Um, and so that's one of the reasons for this, this project. And we're currently implementing a three-phase pilot project with case managers at CMHA Ottawa and also Options by Town in Ottawa to test the integration of social prescribing into Housing First programs to, insist the pro to uh, increase the program's effectiveness at addressing loneliness, community integration, and ultimately enhancing citizenship, which is really a person's connection to the rights, responsibilities, roles, resources, and relationships available in society. Um, social prescribing has been widely practiced across the UK, is identified as the best practice in the UK health system, and has gained growing interest internationally. And we also even now have a um, Canadian social prescribing um, agency, which is really exciting to sort of see come about uh, throughout the course of this uh, project. So really, you know, social prescribing is an approach that helps to connect people with community resources to address their social needs. Um, and to date, it hasn't been widely implemented in Housing First programs, making this pilot one of the first to do so and why this has been such an, an exciting opportunity for us. So in terms of this project, there are um, four objectives that we really um, are looking to, to achieve. Um, and as mentioned, we're collaborating with um, CMHA Ottawa and Options by Town on this project um, in an effort to, to achieve these objectives and, and help them come to fruition. Um, both of organizations have Housing First programs based on the Pathways model. Um, and each Housing First client has a primary case manager working with them who we have the privilege to work with as part of this uh, pilot. So the overall objectives of our social prescribing pilot project are to first identify the needs of clients in Housing First programs with regards to engaging in community activities. The second then is to develop a community building intervention based on the social prescribing approach. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we are looking to do that. Then to pilot the implementation of community building with clients in Housing First programs, both at CMHA on one options by town. And then finally to develop a community building intervention toolkit um, to share the learnings with other um, Housing First programs and really to, to mobilize the knowledge that has been gained throughout the course of this uh, pilot intervention. 
In terms of methods, um, so this project has three phases, so I'll discuss them a little bit um, just to give a bit more context and to sort of um, establish where we are currently in the course of this uh, project. So the first phase um, was a needs assessment to guide the development of the intervention, and that took place really during the first year of the project and was finished um, in June 2023. The second phase is what we're currently in right now, and it's a formative and outcome evaluation of the intervention pilot at CMHA Ottawa and Options by Town. Um, we're hoping and expecting to complete that uh, phase of the project in December 2024. And then the third phase that will follow is that knowledge mobilization strategy to really share our findings and to build and share that toolkit, and that should occur in the last uh, few months of the project. So some of you may remember that Last year's Bright Idea um, Ideas Conference, we had just completed phase one of the project and uh, presented some of the findings from that. So just to maybe reiterate some of what we had done and what we had learned. So in that first um, year, we had conducted focus groups and interviews with clients, um, housing first clients from both CMHA Ottawa and um, Options by Town. We also conducted key informant interviews with program managers. Um, in both organizations to really assess the current state of community engagement experienced by Housing First clients, as well as to really understand the barriers and facilitators um, that they were experiencing when it came to participating in community activities. And that really helped sort of set the stage for us to really think about what this intervention could or should look like and what sort of contextual factors that we also needed to take into consideration when building that, uh, that intervention. So we also developed a community asset map and Huge shout out to our colleague, Minda Wood, who really built um, built that map. Um, it was a lot, it was a lot of work um, and it includes, um, I think currently maybe close to 200 um, different activities um, across the Ottawa area that um, could be of interest to Housing First clients or are also based on what we've learned from uh, the needs assessment from clients and case managers as potential activities. So they're, they range from anything from walking groups to um, organized activities like with churches or through the city of Ottawa, physical activities, more social relaxing activities, meditation, art, music, sports, basically the full gamut of whatever we could sort of find and that could be a potential interest. There's also volunteer activities as well as um, local AA or NA organizations um, and trying to do the best we can to keep that map up to date as some sort of those activities may shift or evolve in terms of their availability or uh, location. Um, I'm guessing some of you may be familiar with it or maybe you've seen it. Um, so it's a giant Excel spreadsheet right now, um, but it's really great where you could sort of filter through based on the type of activities that you're looking for. And the idea is to make it accessible for case managers and for clients to be able to look at in terms of determining what kind of activities clients would like to participate in as part of this uh, pilot intervention. Um, and so, as I mentioned, now we're currently in the second phase of this um, project, which is that formative and outcome evaluation. So I'll talk a little bit about the, the formative evaluation piece of this, um, of this project. So as you can see, we have a number of research questions that we're hoping to answer for this formative evaluation. And they're really focused on also thinking about what this intervention, again, um, could, should look like, how it's being implemented, what we could do to, to facilitate the implementation, what sort of challenges we may need to, to be aware of, and again, try to mitigate or, or address, and also thinking about then what that could mean for other Housing First programs to, to implement such an intervention in the future. So the methods that are being used for this formative evaluation include uh, community practice with case managers and program managers from both organizations. And so the idea is for this community practice to meet, I think it's about once a month um, to sort of discuss how they're implementing this intervention, you know, how social prescribing is working for them, for their clients, and sort of maybe discuss um, some specific cases um, to really sort of work through what, what's happening um, and what can considerations need to, to be recognized um, and also the opportunity to discuss with other case managers and maybe sort of, sort of address some of the challenges and find some solutions and think about this program moving forward. There's also gonna be two peer support groups um, with hopefully about 15 clients 
each one for each organization. Um, so the idea is to have those once a month again, where clients who are participating in this intervention can also have the opportunity to meet, maybe build some connections with each other through that um, group, but also learn from each other, maybe share some of their experiences and also help us understand how this intervention is working from their perspective. Um, and then at the, um, the end, we'll also have some post-intervention interviews with uh, those tenants to, again, try to get a better understanding of their experience, what we need to take into consideration, what we can learn from that experience, and also focus groups with case managers um, and staff at both agencies to, again, help us think through what has worked and what hasn't for the future. And I'll turn it over to Ali now. Awesome. So I'll speak a bit more to the outcome component of phase two. So as you can see on the right hand side of the screen, uh, this uh, aspect or component of phase two will really examine whether housing first tenants who received the social prescribing intervention reported improvements in their levels of citizenship, recovery, community integration, and functioning. So to answer these questions, we're going to use a pre-post design. And so data is going to be collected on outcomes at baseline. So when Housing First clients are recruited to the study and six months later when the intervention is complete. So this data will be collected through structured interviews and will be conducted with all 30 Housing First tenants participating in the pilot intervention. So the interview protocol for collecting this data will include the administration of quantitative validated measures such as like a 20 item citizenship measure to answer question one and the 20 item quality of life interview to answer question four. And so post-intervention interviews will also include open-ended questions to capture any other outcomes that resulted from participating in the prescribed community building activities. So that brings us to like, where are we now? So as uh, mentioned by Elise, uh, phase two of the pilot is well underway. So in December, 2023, we met in person with a group of select frontline staff from CMHA Ottawa and Options Bytown to launch the new social prescribing initiative and to explain the study, study protocol. So since then, uh, we've also created a community building and housing first programs project manual for case managers, which provides like an overview of the project, a brief summary of our needs assessment findings and a description of all intervention components and sessions. We've also recruited 28 out of our desired 30 Housing First tenants to participate in the study and are currently wrapping up our baseline interviews with participants with 79% of them completed so far. In addition, we've held two of our monthly virtual communities of practice with participating case managers of both agencies with our next to take place at the end of May. We've also scheduled our first of our monthly client support groups, which we're really excited about, um, which will take place in person at each CMHA Ottawa and Options by Town later this month. So altogether, I say we're making good progress on phase two of the pilot. And as Elise mentioned, we uh, plan to wrap that up and complete it in December of this year. So that brings us to phase three, which is all about knowledge mobilization. So this will be uh, based on both phase one, so the needs assessment, as well as phase two, uh, which is that formative and summative evaluation. So after all of our quantitative and qualitative data are analyzed, we plan to share the evaluation findings with CMHA Ottawa and Options Bytown through presentations. Uh, we also plan to develop uh, peer-reviewed articles to share the knowledge gained from this pilot study with a broader academic audience. Uh, just to give you an example, we're currently in the process of finalizing a draft of our needs assessment findings to submit to an academic journal. And lastly, this is all going to sort of culminate in the development and dissemination of a community building intervention toolkit based on our study findings to assist CMHA and Options by Town, as well as other Housing First programs in integrating social prescribing into the community support that they already offer their Housing First clients. So altogether, this project has implications across many sectors and impacts stakeholders beyond academia. So finding long-term effective ways to address homelessness contributes to the interests of multiple levels of governments, service providers, community members, and researchers worldwide. So while Housing First has been implemented in many countries, um, as mentioned sort of at the start of our presentation, stakeholders continue to look for ways to enhance the approach in order to go beyond providing stable housing to ensure people are also well integrated into communities and society. 
So this pilot project also has implications specific for CMHA as well as options by town, as it will help clients with their housing first programs to reintegrate into the community through the participation in social, recreational, volunteer, educational, and cultural activities. And this research project also contributes to improving the lives of some of the most vulnerable and underserved people in Canada by providing real supports and services to people who are highly marginalized and socially excluded, focusing on enhancing their rights to citizen participation while also addressing their rights to long-term stable housing. So lastly, uh, this project makes a significant contribution to housing and homelessness research, as well as social prescribing research by piling in an, an enhancement to housing first that can improve the long-term social outcomes of people with serious mental illness with a history of homelessness. So that concludes our presentation today. I uh, very much appreciate the chance to share our findings here and thank you for listening. Um, we're happy to answer any questions that you might have later and we invite you to contact Tim or Christina. You can see their emails here if you'd like more information about the project. Thanks again. Thank you, guys. that was great. And our last but certainly not least um, presentation on a project is Jonathan Samosh, who's a PhD candidate and yet like Kimberly will be chopping off that candidate um, moniker soon. And he's presenting on evaluating the hospital service outcomes of, of our Familiar Faces program, but he'll talk more about that. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you, Donna. Yes, uh, hi, everyone. It's uh, really nice to be with you today. As Donna mentioned, I am Jonathan Samosh, a clinical psychology PhD student at the University of Ottawa. And I'm part of a team led by doctors Tim Obrey and John Sylvest, uh, conducting research with CMHA Ottawa for many years now. So I'm happy to be here today to present some of our past research findings, uh, as well as ongoing research projects regarding the outcomes of CMHA Ottawa's Familiar Faces program, which aims to support frequent emergency department visitors with mental illness or addiction concerns. So hospital emergency departments are designed to help best for things like putting a cast on a broken bone or stitching up a wound, but they're not designed as much to assist with mental illness or addiction concerns. And we know that a small group of emerged visitors with mental illness or addictions make up a disproportionately large amount of total emerged visits, partly because these individuals don't know where else to go. Maybe there is nowhere else to go and also partly because their concerns aren't really managed when they do go to eMERGE, which leads to repeatedly visiting, looking for help, but to no avail. This also leads to increased healthcare costs and longer eMERGE wait times. So as a result, many stakeholders have been increasingly interested in how to help these frequent eMERGE visitors to get the help they need and free up the eMERGE for other services. So two types of community mental health services that can be offered as an alternative to eMERGE visits are system navigation and case management. System navigation refers to providing support to reduce barriers getting connected with needed services like help finding a GP, referral to counseling services, anything like that. And case management in this case refers to more intensive support of client health and social needs uh, and can include services like teaching coping skills, coordinating appointments, some degree of counseling, anything like that. So the Familiar Faces program here uh, receives referrals from Ottawa area hospitals after a frequent eMERGE visitor with mental illness or addiction concerns is identified in the electronic hospital record system. If the referred individual wants to participate in the program, they can receive up to three months of system navigation support and then if they need further assistance, they can be transferred into the program's intensive case management service for up to a further nine months. And the purpose of all this is to help these clients get the help they actually need while reducing the frequent emergency department visits. So um, our first study of Familiar Faces investigated the potential effects of the program on client functioning and uh, experience of symptoms. So to do that, we had about 60 program clients fill out symptom screening questionnaires at program intake, and then again after they had been in the program for at least six months. We found that clients reported improvements in their overall functioning and reduction in their symptoms of anxiety and depression. So the Familiar Faces program was really helping them. 
And that research is being published currently in the Canadian Journal of Community Mental Health in that journal section that recognizes innovative practices in community mental health. Our second study then wanted to assess how Familiar Faces clients experienced their time in the program. So for this study, we interviewed 15 program clients with a broad range of experiences of the program to see what it was like for them. We found that clients reported all kinds of positive benefits of the program indicating that it helped them with mental illness and addiction concerns, but also much more broadly, that it helped with all kinds of other aspects of life, like interpersonal relationships, employment, housing, self-confidence, and so on. And clients particularly highlighted that the most significant variable that promoted positive change for them in the program was the working relationships that they developed with CMHA staff, with, with their case managers. And that research is being published currently in a journal called Professional Case Management, which is focused on publishing about the most up-to-date evidence-based case management practices. So now we come to the third study that's ongoing right now. That is, it's very innovative in the community mental health field. So I'm really happy to share this with you today. This project is being conducted through a new and very exciting relationship developed between CMHA Ottawa and the Ontario Government's Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences, or ICES. Because of this new connection, we now have access to the provincial healthcare records, like you know, OHIP records, hospital records, things like that, uh, of Familiar Faces program clients. So for this project, we're going to look at the healthcare records of about 300 Familiar Faces clients from the two years before their program intake with the two years after their program intake to see if there were any changes in how program clients use the emergency department, how often they were hospitalized, et cetera, so that we can see if their time in Familiar Faces changed how they use the healthcare system. And then we will also compare those numbers to other similar people in Ottawa, Hamilton, and across Ontario who have not received Familiar Faces services. So we can see if there are differences in healthcare service use between people who have and have not received Familiar Faces program support. So more specifically, we're going to match those Familiar Faces clients and the comparison group individuals to ensure they are similar enough using variables like age, sex, diagnosis, and similar patterns of emergency department and hospital service use. And then again, more specifically, the actual outcomes we're going to compare in the study are emergency department visits, hospitalizations, days in hospital, outpatient visits, and primary care visits. So lots more information coming your way about the Familiar Faces program uh, next time. Uh, so stay tuned uh, for that. So as always, uh, it's so meaningful for me to be a part of uh, research with you here at CMHA Ottawa and to get to spend time with you. So thanks very much for having me today. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And uh, the work you've done in this project is such a great example of the commitment that you've had to this project. And I know it hasn't been easy um, over time. There was just a quick question in here, which I think, um, how did you navigate the PHIPAA issues to gain access to documentation with the acute care settings? So maybe because I just, we're not usually answering these questions live, but that's a really important one in around ICES. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, I mean, Donna, you and I both have been involved uh, in that for, for quite a while um, as the privacy officer uh, at CMHA, right? So uh, yeah, it, it took uh, quite a bit of uh, work on the uh, legal side as well. So uh, there were consultations with uh, lawyers um, through CMHA and also through uh, ICES, through the, the government side. Uh, there was a lot of documentation reviewed, a lot of you know contracts put together for that. Um, but uh, fundamentally, one of the reasons why this research is so exciting and so uh, innovative in the community mental health field is that normally the groups that have access to this kind of data are groups like hospitals. But this is one of the kind of first times where really a community mental health agency like CMHA has also done this kind of work. 
So in the hospital kind of system, it's not uncommon for researchers to work with this kind of data. And because of the way that the privacy, um, like the legalities of PHIPAA uh, work, there kind of is more familiarity in the medical system to get all that research set up. Uh, but CMHA was really committed to this and, and did the same kind of work. And I don't know, Donna, how long that took, maybe like two years or something like that to, to work through all of those contracts. But um, you know, you, you're very uh, persistent here in, in wanting to do really high quality research. And so it's really quite amazing that, that that has kind of come through now. Thanks, Jonathan. And, and certainly if there's further um, information you need, Margot, I, we can certainly arrange uh, for that. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. And that's the end of the um, eval the evaluation research presentations. But for the first time, we have a really great presentation on more of a knowledge translation of um, initiative. And I want to introduce Simon Hopkins, who's a student from Carleton School of Journalism, and Patrick Joydain, who's our manager of communications and stakeholder relations here at CMHA Ottawa. Thank you, Donna. Um, so I don't, I actually don't know if Simon, I, I think, I don't think Simon's here. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll speak on Simon's behalf. Um, so our, our presentation focuses on knowledge translation, as Donna said, and the importance of engaging early career journalists in telling accurate stories about our community-based programs and services and the evidence that informs how we work. Um, the 25th Hour is a current affairs news program created by um, senior, undergraduate, senior undergraduate students at Carleton University, um, the School of Journalism and Communication, uh, the renowned Carleton program, journalism program. Uh, journalist Nathan Fung and Simon Hopkins recently put together a mini documentary about Housing First at CMHA Ottawa for the 25th Hour. Um, of course, we know in the Housing First model, people experiencing chronic homelessness in addition to mental health and addictions issues are provided with independent and permanent housing of their choosing without conditions and then provided additional supports and services. Um, at CMHA Ottawa, we use Housing First approach to serve eligible individuals. Um, and it's woven into everything we do. Um, the documentary features our own Mike Murphy, Lisa Med, um, Marianne Roback, Roebuck was behind the scenes. And of course, Dr. Tim O'Brien was featured in the video. I will now share my screen. Without further ado, you don't want to hear from me. You want to hear from Nathan and Mike and uh, Lisa and Tim. OK. That was me um, buying time, if you hadn't gathered. Uh, one quick second. Sorry about this. I can't walk and chew gum at the same time, as they say. All right, does everybody see Nathan? This is the Byward Market, which can be the epicenter for people who are experiencing homelessness in Ottawa. Four of the city's biggest emergency shelters are located within a five-minute walk from here. According to the city data, between 2019 and 2023, there were close to 2,000 people in Ottawa's shelters every night. People without permanent housing are struggling, especially those with mental health problems and addictions. And the Canadian Mental Health Association says that the intersection of homelessness and mental health can be devastating. They're also critical of the usual steps model that gets people housed only after they've received treatment. That's why in the city they've advocated for a different approach. It's called housing first. Getting people housed, no strings attached. Okay, welcome to 1414, newest CMHA condo. It's uh, yeah, it's a little a little dated, but we have some renos planned. Kind of looks like uh, we're in an Easter egg, but we'll get it renovated, painted up. This is Mike Murphy, a coordinator for the CMHA's Housing First Condos. Moving into your own apartment for the first time is a pretty incredible experience. 
It's normal apartments like this the CMHA is providing to its clients. This is a newly acquired unit the CMHA is preparing for someone. You would just want to get out of the shelter. So I've had people move into something really just as bare as this apartment, and we'll get them a, uh, an air mattress and some blankets or a sleeping bag and some pots and pans and some basic groceries just for that first couple of days. And then often they just want to sleep, <laughs> rest, recover, because they've been living in chaos for so long. Um, yeah, in the next couple of months, hopefully this will be someone's, someone's new home. Uh, you need some stability to be able to address all that underlying trauma. And that's what housing brings. Bring, housing gives them a chance, an opportunity to start rebuilding, to start their recovery. It can be really basic things like um, you're sleeping better, eating better, just taking better care of yourself, um, revisiting hobbies and interests that you might have, um, but it also extends to bigger things. The CMHA says that the outcomes are better when the supportive housing sites, like the one we just saw, are scattered throughout the city, as opposed to forcing people who need them into segregated group homes where they are less easily able to work on their mental health. So to understand this a little bit more, we went to the CMHA's offices to speak to someone who's in charge of running the program. Yeah, so the scattered site is one of the foundational pieces of a housing first approach in that you want you're aiming to have people housed in kind of natural communities, uh, you know, where they where they want to live, where they're living in a typical apartment like everybody else. For some people, it, it's a it's a great step towards um, school and employment, like they they're they're in a place where they're feeling better, they're doing well, and their recovery is at a state where they're taking new steps. Everyone we spoke to at the CMHA emphasized one point. The Housing First policies are evidence-based and that the research shows that it works better than any other approach to homelessness. So to understand this a little bit more, we went to the University of Ottawa to speak to someone who has studied homelessness in the city for decades. In terms of its effectiveness for ending homelessness, the evidence is pretty unequivocal. Studies like the At Home Shea Spa Project demonstration have shown the effectiveness of Housing First. Researchers found that people receiving housing first achieved superior housing outcomes. All of them have found um, consistently um, that uh, 80 to 90 percent of people who receive uh, housing first, uh, and usually they're coming out of a, a, a chronic kind of course of homelessness, it ends that homelessness. What's particularly unique uh, about the condominium program is that it creates housing. One of the big challenges um, for Housing First programs right now across Canada is finding um, rental housing for people um, in, in, in the private market. But provided housing can go wrong. Take this 2017 CBC story. A privately owned apartment was used in a different Ottawa housing program. Caseworkers failed to check in on the tenant, and the result was a trash department and a landlord stuck with the bill. But Aubrey says the housing first approach isn't to blame. When it you know when it happens, and I'm familiar with those kind of stories, they've shown up in the media. Often it's not housing first that's being that's being delivered to the person. Often it's only housing without the support. And that seems to be the key takeaway here. It's housing first, but not just housing. It's effective because housing is then followed by support that person needs. And whoever moves into that empty condo unit we visited earlier will have access not just to a new home, but to the CMHA services. They can work with their caseworker to figure out the next best steps. That could be addiction treatment, mental health counseling, financial services, as well as schooling. And all of that was possible because they were housed first. And I'll just sort of finish it off by mentioning, um, hopefully we get Nathan back next year because he has for um, his, to, to make housing first. Um, oh, my YouTube is still going. His, uh, his area of study in his final year. That's great. Thank you. I hope my, am I not muted, am I not? I can't see the screen anymore to know. 
We hear you, Donna. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> the voice of Marianne floats in. So we've gone a little over and we have a few more slides to sum up around past and, and current upcoming research projects. So we understand if people have to um, bounce out right at noon for other commitments, but we're going to continue on because the session's being recorded. So we have everything down um, that can be shared. So for our final couple of slides, um, we have Dr. Marianne Robach, uh, who's a Director of Integration Research and Evaluation. This is a position that we share. And Todd Bridger, who's our Manager of Quality Assurance and Improvement. So take it away, guys. I think you're up first, Todd. Yes, uh, thanks, Donna. Hopefully everybody can hear me. So the first uh, slide I'd like to present is from research to innovation and innovation to research. And you can actually switch those as around, around as well. Um, uh, over the years, we've certainly experienced, uh, I guess, what we could call novel approaches to providing service. And then we take a look at how, uh, what is, what are the components of those novel approaches that are working, and and why that's so important to do research and evaluation activities, not only to demonstrate uh, what's working in our programs, uh, but also to improve our programs and also be able to um, share that information with other services uh, in our communities to help hopefully uh, provide uh, better services to the clients they serve as well. So on the left hand, you'll see these are far side comics. Um, uh, one that says early experiment, experiments in transportation. And obviously this might have been a novel approach. Somebody discovered that if you cut a rock into a circle, it will roll faster than something that has jagged edges, et cetera. So they're setting up an experiment, but they haven't necessarily thought of, uh, and they put all the control factors in place, but they haven't necessarily thought of uh, some of what you might call the balancing measures or our negative externalities could occur, could occur because of the uh, invention or, or a novel approach. And so when I look at this, when I think to myself, how many uh, runs of this experiment can they do? And from my count, I don't think they can do much more than four, because unfortunately, the individual on top of the rock might not uh, make it through. And that's why it's so important to be thoughtful in the methodology of your experiments and the things you're doing and think of the consequences and, and really uh, take time to set it out pro properly and measure the results. The second side or the one on, on your right, uh, uh, so... What is this? I asked for a hammer. A hammer? Uh, this is a crescent wrench. Well, maybe a hammer. Uh, maybe it's a hammer. And darn these uh, uh, stone tools. So essentially, if, if, if we don't have the data and we don't break out the component parts, then it's like they say, if the only thing you own a hammer is a hammer, everything you see is a nail, right? So we need to know what the components of what we do are in order to, to actually be able to improve our services and to do so in a succinct way, a way and to make it replicable uh, so we can replicate the results going forward. And that's where you see uh, discussions regarding fidelity assessments and whatnot as well, because they're evidence-based practices. And we know if we're as adherent to the model as possible, then the outcomes are likely to be better for the clients we serve. Next slide, Donna. So quality improvement, uh, when we listen, hear that term, we think of many different things, but sometimes we don't. Sometimes we do research and the question often comes, you know, what do you do with the research after it's done? Like, where does it go? How is it used, et cetera? And I thought this slide was very poignant in that uh, it really demonstrates that uh, research uh, also informs quality improvement as so many other things do as well. Total quality management, lean, lean six sigma, Deming, so that's Edward Deming, whose famous quote was, you can't manage what you don't measure. So it goes back to measurement, measurement, measurement. And, and the same goes with quality assurance. And so if any, all these things we're doing, um, if, if we do it in a thoughtful manner and plan approach, uh, can actually contribute to improving the services we provide to clients. And again, having a level of quality assurance. So that what we what the novel approach that was so good today, now we know the components of tomorrow, we're gonna do the same way and with as little variance in that approach as possible. Next slide, Donna. So in, in 2023, for those who joined us during the Bright Ideas 
uh, morning. Uh, we, uh, the, the research and evaluation activities that directly improve what we do and offer, these are a few examples. So we had a needs assessment for discharge planning from intensive case management services, MHA Ottawa, and uh, where a lot of things came out in regards to, uh, you know, early identification of clients and discussions regarding uh, uh, discharge as being a natural and transitions in care being a natural part of services and being goals attached to that as well. Uh, and then the other one that was associated with that was uh, length of time in services or characteristics of people in ICM longer than five years. And that's where we started to see like, you know, uh, you know, uh, the senior population and, and, and the, 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 you know, people 55 and over uh, being in the services longer and people with uh, co-occurring substance use disorder and complex health needs being in services longer as well. And, and it gave us an opportunity to be uh, uh, more intentional in our discussions regarding service interactions, including discharge built into ICM early uh, in the relationship. Uh, we've developed dashboards. We were developing them at the time um, for the frontline staff, man managers, and hopefully at some point for clients to, to use for the service decisions as well. Um, and uh, and uh, the, also they contain clinical assessment scores, again, to help uh, and, in and identifying individuals for transitions, including discharge, and provide feedback for clients around progress and be able to demonstrate that back to them. And ultimately that's decision support. You know, whether you're the, uh, the clinician providing the service, want to feedback the information to the client or the recipient of services, these all help you make decisions in regards to where you go next and what you need next. Uh, further research uh, um, sponsored to look at the unique needs of seniors. We heard about that this morning and who may be more uh, uh, difficult to transition out of intensive case management for several reasons. Next slide, Donna. Thank you. Uh, so this was the one in regards to recovery college uh, uh, program, and it was a formative evaluation. And again, that information uh, can be used for uh, the positive supporting, advocating for and securing funding to keep the program going. Um, ident uh, identified a CMHA auto recipient of funds generated from CMHA nationals, the push-up challenge for mental health. And we've certainly seen the importance of, uh, of reco recovery college uh, in a lot, on a, in a lot, of, lot of different areas, um, and uh, one of the ones that stands out to to me the most, and Rebecca was so eloquent in speaking to, is that the uh, co-production of the training modules and the impact that has on the uh, people experiencing the, the training. Uh, in 2023, uh, developing an organizational culture for supervision in community based mental health. Um, again, that was presented by. Uh, uh, two of our uh, managers here at CMHA and supported by, uh, uh, by Carleton University. And, and, and that has supported us moving forward and really moving towards embedding a uniform model of clinical su supervision across CMHA Ottawa. And that work continues to go on today. So, and that's the, one of the things with the research evaluation activities of CMHA is that really now taking a very uh, uh, concerted approach and, and deliberate approach to, to making sure that the studies we did a year ago and some of them even two years ago haven't just stopped there, rather they're building on the information we need and we continue to improve upon the, the services we provide. Uh, next slide. So I thought I'd finish off with this one. So, you know, whether it's a novel approach we're studying or implementing the evidence-based practice and we're doing the Fidelity review, um, at the end of the day, the research, all research is done with a purpose but not necessarily all research is that, that we decide to do is decided to do with purpose. And we've often spoke about, we build the services based on the felt needs of the clients uh, we, that we serve. And so when we, when we choose the things that we want to study and evaluate, um, that's really where those things should come from. And we're really take, making efforts to make sure that they are, that they're really to enhance um, services uh, through the eyes of our clients and the people providing uh, the services, really seeing those gaps and looking to close those gaps. So this one is the innovation will change, this innovation will change the course of man. You would think it'd be the wheel, right? No, I call it a hammer and chisel. And why? Because the wheel was a novel approach to get people somewhere faster. But at the end of the day, if you can't replicate that great thing you just discovered, whether you're a frontline staff person or whatever it is, so that's you can replicate it for everybody else, 
going forward, it doesn't matter. So we need to define what those tools are because it's those tools that are going to make, make, allow us to continue uh, doing the great things we do. So that's the end of my presentation. And, and thank you very much, everyone, for uh, allowing me to be here and for us to be here with you today. And now on to Marianne. Thank you, Todd. Oh. <laughs> okay, we're excited to look forward into what we will be sharing at next year's Bright Ideas event. And I just want to highlight three ways that we will continue to build in the year ahead. Firstly, we'll continue to build bridges. We'll build partnerships with universities and colleges and partnerships with other community agencies. This year, we'll have new proposals. Oh, stay on that slide just for a second, Donna. I know, I'll go quickly. This year, we'll have new, pardon? Great. <laughs> This year we'll have new proposals for CREX program evaluation students to tackle uh, some of our evaluation needs and to develop their core evaluation skills in the process. We'll hopefully bring on new med school students to summarize some research literature for us. We're working on a new MSW research placement and an honors student. We'll stay tuned for the results of John Samlosh's Familiar Faces Outcome Evaluation and Kim Turner's ongoing work on digital health equity. And we look forward to the results of the Building Citizenship Social Prescribing Project, just to name a couple. Next slide. Secondly, we continue to build the community mental health research base. You can click once, Donna, there. When we contribute to community mental health research literature, it's because we know there are significant gaps in community mental health research and we're conducting studies that address those gaps. We have a voice in academic and policy spaces. These are three studies that we pub published this past year that we were involved in conducting and we were involved in the publications. We have another publication in press on the length of time in intensive case management, and we have other publications that are in the pipelines. Again, we, we continue to work on building the research base for community mental health. And then thirdly, we, next slide, Donna. We continue to build CMHA Ottawa, the agency. Through research and evaluation, we're committed, like Todd said, to translating the knowledge collected and analyzed through research and evaluation into improvements in the agency and improved client care. We do this in several ways, which have been profiled well today. We do this through um, being utilization focused from the very beginning of the studies by bringing on advisors to the studies who are staff, peers, and clients. We do this through creating videos like the explainer video, uh, creating toolkits and research summaries, presenting the findings in staff meetings and team meetings and committees internally. Some examples of how we'll do that in the upcoming year will be through Conrad's DEI work, we'll translate his work into supporting our terms of reference for our DEI committees, into identifying appropriate training materials for our committees and guiding the overall DEI work of the agency. Another example is through Christina and Rebecca's work on the Recovery College Evaluation Framework. It will strengthen our Recovery College evaluations in the future. So I also wanna just take a moment to thank everybody who was involved in today. Thanks to Donna for her emceeing. Thanks to the Decision Support and Accountability team for their coordinating. Thanks to all the staff and peers and clients who were involved in these studies and to everybody who presented today. Thanks, Marianne. And we didn't do too bad for time. We appreciate those who were able to hang in there to the bitter end. Um, so we really, really thank everyone for your interest and we look forward to seeing you for more Bright Ideas next year. And we just ask to please don't forget to complete what else? An evaluation. And uh, we look forward, we will be posting on our website the links to this tape. And then plus by the fall, we'll have the final report ready for distribution as we do every year. So thanks so much. Have a great weekend, everyone. Enjoy the tulips. Bye-bye.